Welcome to this meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, April 26, 2018. Um, we were waiting for ACMI to get started. And I want, before we get going, I want to mention that uh, Mr. Schwickman will be about an hour late because of work commitment and Mr. Thielman will not be able to join us at all also because of a work commitment. And thank you to our AEA representative, Mr. Levy. Um, and that's, I guess we don't have a student representative. So is there any public participation? No. Oh, okay, moving on. Um, District Goal 1.1 update, uh, Mr. McNeil and curriculum leaders. Okay. Yeah. So good evening. good evening. So I'm here to share the work that uh, the curriculum leaders and I and the directors have done around District Goal 1.1. Um, so our objective is to share the work that has been completed, um, to share the process and why certain documents and how they fit together regarding um, Goal 1.1, to share the work products and to respond to any questions or comments. So we'll start off. I want to introduce all the curriculum leaders and directors in the, for the District of Arlington. So we have Bill Papasisis. He's the Director of Performing Arts. We have Cindy Bouvier, who's Director of Health and Wellness. We have Larry Weathers, Director of Science. We have Linda Hansen, who's actually a literacy coach, but she also serves in helping us with uh, K-5 literacy. We have Susan Bisson, our new director of digital learning. We have Deb Perry, director of ELA K-12, through and all the directors are K-12. through We have Matt Coleman, director of math K-12, through Denny Denton Conklin, Director of Social Studies K through 12. We have Margaret Thomas, uh, Director of METCO, and we have Sarah Bird, Director of Social and Emotional Learning. I have a really good memory, don't I? <laughs> Impressive. And so this is the agenda. So we're going to go through and we're going to talk about the vision of student as learner and global citizen, our vision statement. Then we're going to talk about the transferable skills. Then we're going to go into the essential standards. I know that the goal had us looking at the essential standards for different grade levels and content area, but after looking at the, you know, the type of work that we had to do around this particular um, part of the goal, we decided to focus on one grade for this year, and then going <laughs> forward, we'll be able to expand that to other grades. And then we have examples of personalized learning within the district. <laughs> And so then we'll, and we'll end with question or comments uh, from the committee. So we're going to start off. Um, Deb is going to join me. And then as the presenters, each, each, each person will present at different slides. So as, they, as, they, as their slide comes up, they will, um, they will come up here to the table. So we want to talk about first about the vision of student as learn, learner and global citizen. And the vision of student learner and global citizen is uh, uh, characteristics that we uh, would like all students to have that we focus on within our each content area and through our instruction. And then by the time uh, students graduate from Arlington Public Schools, we hope that they have these particular characteristics and dispositions in order to be successful, whether or not they go on to a higher learning uh, institution or within, you know, in society in general. So uh, part of the process, if you want to join in, talk about the process that started last year among the district administrators and how the creation of the vision statement began. And then we'll talk about the process that we went through this year in order to vet the statement. Yeah, the, um, we, uh, the department leaders, um, met last year every other week. And um, from the winter through till the, about this time in the spring, we would weekly, or bi-weekly when we met, talk about um, these various categories, the student as learner and student as global citizen. And we would sort of, we would, sort of people would throw things out and we'd react to it. And it was a, it was a wonderful um, set of discussions around ideas and what we thought 
education was about and what learning was about and what kids should look like once they got out of this place. So we came up with a few drafts. Um, Denny and Catherine Ritz did some wordsmithing and finally came up with uh, final, the two final drafts that you saw um, at the beginning of this, this past year in the fall. And we felt, we, I'm not sure we felt that, they, that we were quite complete, but we felt pretty good about the work that we'd done and the thinking that we'd done to get to that point. And it, was, it wasn't arduous work, but it was, um, it was intense work. Because when you're really stopping to think about what a student should be, when we <laughs> release them to the world, um, it's a fairly, it's a huge, um, it's a huge task, and and it and it represents the work of, of so many people. We want it to be complete, and we want it to be um, really thoughtful about what people should be, you know, should possess as they walk out of a school and into into the universe. Can you click on the vision statement link? Uh, in the blue? Will it show up? Oh, okay. So it's a PDF. So in your packet, you have the updated version of the vision statement. Mm -hmm. um, and so, is it working? Oh, that's okay. So you have the updated version. I, I put it in your packet, it's the original version that we started out with this year, and then we have the updated version. So that's, that's okay, you can go back to the presentation. So as, as Deb said, we started there. So through the process this year, we've shared it with uh, school councils, uh, building faculty, and, and we've received feedback. We've also uh, met with Vision 2020 uh, one night, and we talked to them and shared the, the version at the time with them, and then they gave feedback. And so we've made several edits to the um, vision statement, as you will see, as you compare from the original to the updated version. And so we have what we think is a very comprehensive uh, list of characteristics that we want to focus on with our, uh, with our students through you know, various content areas and grade levels. So, um, so that is the vision statement, the process and the product on the, on the vision statement. So moving right along. We're going to have Bill Papazisis and Margaret Thomas, and they're going to come. And I will take questions at the end, but I want to get through the whole presentation because uh, it's quite long. And, and then at the end, we, will, we can, I can, if that would be better, the best way to entertain questions, okay? Good evening. Transferable skills are those skills that cross and are embedded in every content area and at every grade level. They are called transferable because they look the same regardless of how students use them. Martin Yate, a well-known and highly regarded career strategist, provides us with some clarity around their importance and how they apply in the real and rapidly evolving world for which we are preparing our students. And he says, Regardless of profession or title, at some level, we are all hired to do the same job. We are all problem solvers, paid to anticipate, identify, prevent, and solve problems within our areas of expertise. This applies to any job, at any level, in any organization, anywhere in the world. So we have identified these eight transferable skills to embed in our curriculum here in Arlington. Our work referenced the Partnership for 21st Century Learning, the Common Core State Standards Initiative, Tony Wagner's Seven Survival Skills, among many others that each of us use and have, uh, and have referenced in our work in our departments. And Margaret and I will provide you with a brief definition of each of these skills, and we'll conclude by providing some clarification on how they might look in curriculum instruction as we move forward. You'll also see a number of examples uh, when we uh, talk about essential skills later in the presentation. Flexibility and adaptability refer to how we work effectively in diverse teams. When we work in teams, as we often do, our success in achieving common goals relies on our willingness and ability to be flexible, open and responsive to new and diverse perspectives, and to incorporate input and feedback into the work. As participants in collaborative work, we assume shared responsibility and we value the contribution of others. Global and cultural awareness provide us with important contexts when working with others. 
When we are globally and culturally aware, we demonstrate respect for cultural differences. We work effectively with people from a broad range of social and cultural backgrounds. We're able to respond open-mindedly to different ideas and values. And we purposefully use these understandings to create new and innovative ideas and increase the quality of our work. When we teach our students to think creatively and imaginatively, we empower them to use a variety of strategies and tools to create new and worthwhile ideas. Throughout the creative process, students refine, analyze, and evaluate their own ideas to maximize their efforts. Their work exhibits originality and inventiveness so that ultimately, they will be able to act on their ideas to make tangible and useful contributions to a field. When we provide students with opportunities to think critically, they begin to use inductive and deductive reasoning and apply them appropriately in a variety of situations. They can analyze how the parts of a whole interact to, uh, to produce complex systems. They can analyze and evaluate evidence and arguments, claims and beliefs and points of view to make informed decisions and judgments. And together, with, together while using creative and imaginative thinking, they can solve problems in both conventional and innovative ways. Also what they can do, the next um, is the expressive and respect, receptive communica um, communication skills. They can ar ar articulate thoughts and ideas effectively, listen effectively and decipher meaning, use communication of, for a range of purposes, use multiple, multiple media and technologies, communicate effectively in diverse environments. Um, for their social responsibility and ethics for students, demonstrate integrity and ethical behavior in using influence and power, act responsibly with the interests of the larger community in mind, and demonstrate an understanding of one's actions and decisions on others. Also, what they can do is demonstrate understanding of one's civic responsibility and its impact on the larger community. Um, another one of the transferable skills that we're going to talk about is the digital literacy, where they'll be able to access information and evaluate information, how to use it and manage it. Um, the other thing about this is that they use the technology to, for research, organization, evaluating, um, and to communicate that information. <clears throat> Using digital technologies, communication, networking tools, and social networks to successfully function in a knowledge of economy. The next one would be the self-awareness and self-efficacy. The students would be able to understand and be able to leverage one's own strengths and weaknesses, self-assess, one's own strengths and weaknesses and develop appropriate goals for personal, academic, and professional growth, understand and self-regulate their emotions, respond appropriately in the moment to people and situations, and clearly communicate one's own beliefs and thoughts. Uh, and, and just to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to wrap up, uh, when we begin and embed these transferable skills into the curriculum, it transforms, it transforms the way in which we approach teaching and learning. We provide opportunities for students to develop these skills discreetly across all content areas and interdisciplinary themes while still maintaining deep learning in each of the disciplines. Those opportunities includes, include personalized learning, use of a variety or digital and supportive technologies, inquiry and problem-based approaches, and higher order thinking skills. And they also open pathways to integrate community resources beyond the school walls. And I just want to point out the, you know, we chose the sequence of presenting the various documents uh, with a purpose. So the vision statement is our, with, we're starting with the end in mind and we're, we're going through, this is how we're going to get there. So looking at the transferable skills, we're teaching, you know, these are embedded in each one of the content areas as we, as we approach instruction. So we want to model our instruction to make sure that we are 
looking at these or including these transferable skills, if you will, like soft skills, some, sometimes people call them soft skills, and making sure that we're including that into the content and, as, and adding it to the, the way that we're teaching the content. So giving students an opportunity to um, exhibit these skills, and then we're also looking at ways that we can assess them as we are teaching the content. So we're moving right along. So we started with the vision statement. So this is where we want our students to end up, looking at the transferable skills, saying that they have to have these skills in order to get to this place where we want them to be and have these particular characteristics. And so now we're going to go into the essential standards. And so at first we were looking at the, the word power standards, and I know that's written into the goal. And we, we decided to use essential instead of power because the essential standards, these are the standards that we want to make sure that teachers are addressing as they go through the, the curriculum or the content throughout the year. And this will prepare students for the next level. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to address the other standards. We want to make sure that these standards are focused, that, that they are included, and that we focus on these standards so that students are prepared as they matriculate through each one of the grades. So as we get into um, looking at the essential standards, each one of the curriculum leaders has prepared a slide and will come and discuss the various, the, the essential standards in their particular content area or discipline. And so we're going to start off with uh, Denny because he actually has to leave. So he's gonna start off with social studies. There you go. Hi everyone, it's good to see you again. I feel like I should come back next week for the hat. <laughs> Great, but you need happy to get to. home to your baby. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit of how we decided on the essential standards for social studies in fourth grade. Um, and on this side over here, you can see some of the foundations of how we arrived at those essential standards on the other side of the slide. Um, so we started by looking at what are the four main domains of social studies, and you can see those up there. Um, history and culture is one of the big ones. Geography, civics and citizenship, and economics. Um, those are the four big areas also that the state frameworks point out. Um, should be investigated within the a study of social studies. Um, so we took a look at how those main areas are represented within the fourth grade curriculum. Then we took into consideration um, a variety of things down here. Obviously the mass state history and social sciences frameworks. Um, for the purposes of what you see up here, this references the ones from 2003, but certainly if the ones from this year, 2018, get passed, this might look a little bit different. Um, the Common Core State Standards, understanding the fact that um, a lot of the stuff within social studies involves reading, writing, speaking, listening, um, and trying to make sure that we're touching base with the different ELA frameworks that correspond to those areas as well in the Common Core State Standards. And then we wanted to keep in mind the two areas of knowledge and skills. Um, knowing that in social studies and history, it's important to have that content information, to have knowledge, um, but it's more important to know what you're actually gonna do with that knowledge, and that gets us into the skills part of it. Um, so with all those things kept in mind, these are some of the, this is a sampling of some of the essential standards for fourth grade. Um, I should mention too, so these are different than what you'll see in the Massachusetts frameworks, because could, we could have just thrown copy and pasted the Massachusetts state frameworks up here, but this represents what we've decided as a district are the essential skills and standards that we want students to get in social studies. You'll see that there's um, a variety. They're classified into the different domains of social studies that they hit. Um, first one, for example, fourth grade is a big study of the regions of the United States. Um, so in the first one, you can see that we're asking students to compare and contrast the climates, physical features, natural resources, human populations, and products that the different regions of the United States produce. So this is combining the history, the geography, and the economics. So the students are learning about some of the history in each region learning about the major geographic features, and then about trade within each region. Um, I won't go through all of them. Another big topic within fourth grade is immigration. Um, this has been an area where we've done some great work with ELA on an integrated unit. Um, so for immigration students, we want them to be able to describe the push and pull factors that increased immigration in the late 1800s. Um, so that taps into their historical knowledge um, and understanding a lot, bit about economics and the economic factors that drove people in and out of countries. Um, some specific skills for geography, defining latitude and longitude, and how that 
relates to finding a specific place, um, then a great civics one um, tied to that immigration unit, describing how communities welcome new people and groups to their communities. So having us have a better understanding of how we all get along, how we get together, and how our communities are this give and take relationship and that when immigrants come to new communities, they change those communities, the immigrants themselves change, all the people within them change, and it's this really rich um, exchange of ideas and of people that we see within it. Um, so these are the essential standards for social studies in fourth grade. Um, one last thing I'll note is that those four main domains of social studies are connected also to elementary school progress reports. So this is also how we are assessing students um, on the elementary school progress reports. Um, with history and culture, geography, civics, and citizenship. The only one we still need to add is economics um, because I think teachers are going to want a little bit more PD in that before we throw that onto the progress reports. Um, but that doesn't mean that the economics uh, principles aren't being incorporated in the fourth grade um, social studies stuff. Thank you. So now we're going to go back. We're going to start off with, oh, and I also want to add that um, Carla Prusasi uh, is our director of ELL, and she was not able to be here, but her slide is in there, so you can view it. Hi. Good evening, everybody, and a special welcome to the newest member on the committee. So I'm here to talk about the ELA essential standards, and we stuck very closely to the Mass Common Core standards, and we tried to organize them in a way that helps you understand how um, the state really organizes the concepts and skills that we want kids to know at every grade level in the realm of literacy and communication. We also wanted to have a template that would hold true and be relevant across all of the grade levels, so something that would be consistent. And finally, because of the global nature of the skills in um, English literacy and communication, we really felt like we couldn't parse things out, so um, this is pretty complete. Um, the way it looks here on the upper left-hand quadrant, so for reading, there are kind of two strands, literary text and informational text, and there are four main categories under that, key ideas and details, craft and structure, integration of knowledge and ideas, and range of reading and text complexity. And then we have writing on the right quadrant, um, three different kinds of writing, opinion pieces, inform informative and explanatory texts, narratives, and then down below, lower left, we have speaking and listening that focuses on specifically collaboration and presentation of knowledge and ideas, and then the more kind of standard classic conventions, grammar and vocabulary. So I thought I'd pull out just two examples to help you understand how this lives in a fourth grade curriculum. Um, and I thought on the left-hand side, we'd take a look at um, the unit called Reading the Weather, Reading the World, which is a nonfiction information unit at the fourth grade level. And what that looks at is um, helping students understand that by understanding how text works and the structure of the text, it can help us understand the text better. So chronological order, comparison contrast, cause and effect, pro con, problem solution. And in this particular text uh, unit, students are asked to take on a specific topic in a high interest area of extreme weather and natural disasters, so earthquake, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, um, floods, that kind of thing. And they're organized in, in small collaboration groups, research groups, so that kind of hits down below at speaking and listening. They work together as a team to research this topic and then the presentation aspect is after they've gone through that process, they share out to a group that's, that studied a different topic. And then for the last bend of the unit, they actually swap and take on a new topic. Um, their team does new research, and then they're able to do some compare and contrast, and again, report out either to another group or to the whole class. So then in the upper right-hand side, I thought maybe we'd just take a quick peek at opinion writing. Uh, we do that through two units of study in fourth grade. One is the boxes and bullets unit where they're really introduced to the persuasive essay format. And in that unit, kids can really generate a, a, their own thesis on a broad range of topics, something that's really interesting to them. So like, um, but something that's also meaty enough that, that it's defensible with examples and reasons. So like, so-and-so is the best soccer player in the U.S. Soccer League, or the perennial favorite fourth graders should not have homework. 
um, or Black Friday is terrible for society, something that, you know, that they care about, and then they're kind of walked through how to develop that in, in an essay format. And then that leads into an actual an introduction to the literary essay, which you might be thinking, as we did originally, really, in fourth grade, we're going to start you know, introducing them to that pretty sophisticated um, format. But we do, and the kids really rise to the occasion. We use short stories, and kids can pick a short story of their choice that resonates with them. They develop their own thesis statement. So the idea is there's not one correct thesis statement for any piece. And then um, they're led through a process for how to use evidence from the text to, to support that thesis statement. So example might be like the, the picture book Fly Away Home that some of you might be familiar with. Um, something like a thesis statement could be the bird symbolizes breaking free just like the child in the story wants to break free and then go on to kind of prove that with evidence from the text. Or another one called Slower Than the Rest people can rise above a challenge, or another possible thesis for that same story, it doesn't matter how you do something if you get it done in the end. So there's a whole range of levels of sophistication, but the idea is the kids are coming up with it on their, on their own, and then learning how to support that. So that's what I have. Moving right on, we have digital literacy. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here uh, for the second time, I think, in front of this group. Um, in 2016, uh, the state of Massachusetts revamped their digital literacy and computer science standards. And so the first part of this slide is taken from that document. Um, and the DLCS uh, knowledge, reasoning, and skills um, as I think we really know now, are essential to prepare students for personal and civic efficacy in the 21st century and prepare and inspire students to pursue innovative and creative careers in the future. Uh, the abilities um, to effectively use and create technology to solve problems are the new and essential literacy skills of the 21st century. So our focus really is to um, uh, have students be able to understand how to be safe and responsible online. We want them to learn to use digital tools in order to make their thinking visible. We also um, are using digital uh, tools to help students collaborate and work with their peers, and also just generally to communicate ideas um, to each other, uh, their classmates, their teachers, and beyond, to families, to students in other towns, districts, and maybe even in other countries. Um, as Linda did, I will just give a very quick example of um, a group of fifth grade boys that I recently sat with who were doing a final project on the book Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Um, we were a small group and I sat with their teacher and they were using something called Spark Video. Um, and I'm a big believer in choosing the right tool for the job to really meet the learning goals. So this, this uh, platform is really nice because it allows students to choose images and also create a pretty sophisticated looking um, product in the end. So these boys had an opportunity to um, really demonstrate and reinforce those transferable skills. They were doing critical thinking, they were being very creative, they were working on their communication skills, they reinforced their comprehension because they'd be talking about uh, the, the younger brother in the book, Fudge, who has eaten his brother's turtle. And they're talking about, well, what would be a good picture? There's a bank of pictures you can choose from. And they would search and then decide and look at each other's photos and say, well, that doesn't really look like Fudge. Oh, this looks much more like him. There was a child with spaghetti on him or something. Um, and so... Uh, you know, I think that that's just a little glimpse into how we're really using um, digital literacy and teaching digital liter literacy to help our students meet their learning goals. Thank you. Next one. 
Next up, we have uh, Cindy Bouvier, Health and Wellness. Hello. Um, I came today to talk a little bit about the standards for health and wellness. So we have not been using the state standards um, because in health and wellness, they're about 20 years old. They keep saying they're going to redo them. So we've sort of moved with several other communities. I go to meetings um, often with um, wellness coordinators from other communities, and most people have moved to the national standards. So, so that's what I'll speak to tonight. So as far as physical education goes um, in grade four, the first one is basically demonstrates competency of skills. So um, this, this is done in several ways, um, you know, through locomotor skills, jumping, um, skipping, performing um, tumbling, uh, dribbling, jump rope. And to give some examples of how they reach that, um, it can be through um, the bracket school has a rock climbing wall. And um, so, and many of the schools celebrate the Olympics um, when those are on. So, I mean, it can be through that and it can be through physical education units as well. So different units, they don't compete um, per se at the elementary level, but they definitely um, have different structured units to follow as well. So the second one, the physically literate individual applies knowledge of concepts and um, tactics and movement and performance. And um, well, one challenge we have is, uh, but, but they do a really good job at it is creating space um, because we have a large population of students. Um, we have a smaller space availability, but they've, they've done a really good job at creating space and um, learning how to do the tumbling and balancing skills and kicking and striking skills as well. So the third one, um, the physically literate individual, demonstrates the knowledge and skills to achieve and maintain health enhancing level of physical activity. I think this is the most important one um, because kids have to like what they're doing. In order for it to become a lifelong skill, you have to sort of like what you're doing. And, um, and this, is, this is an example of um, before school programs, after school programs that are available to students. The Fit Girls program happens in every elementary school, every fourth grade is available to do it. Um, so kids that have a love of running might, might join that group. And uh, Boys in Motion is the, is, the, is the boys. And through the Fitness Gram program that we have, um, it's the first year that we start testing and um, students are tested in grade four through grade nine in Fitness Gram. So that's cardio, um, cardiovascular wise. It could be through push-ups, through sit-ups, curl-ups, and so on and so forth. Um, the fourth one, the physically literate individual exhibits personal and social behavior that respects others. Very important. It's important for those children when they're in the gymnasium to have, have sensitivity, to be sure um, that they're following safety guidelines, and, and, they, do this, and they do this well. Um, and the last one, the physically literate indi individual recognizes the value of physical activity for health, enjoyment, challenge, and self-expression. And this is basically what I was saying. You know, they have to find activities that will follow them for the rest of their life. And so um, during this, it may be a fitness challenge that's happening at one of the schools. Um, it, it, with families and students um, for fun, it could be... Um, it could be through after-school programs, before-school programs, and just even if they pick up something in one of, the, one of the units that they feel like they love to do, they create backyard individual activities that, that go with it. So um, as far as the health standards go, we, these are K through 12. So we do address many of them, not every single one. Um, the, the, let me just tell you, we use the Great Body Shop curriculum, and I know you're all familiar with that. So the physical education staff in the fourth grade teach two of the units, and the classroom teacher teaches um, the other eight units. The physical education staff mainly um, teach about the digestive system and nutrition in the beginning of the year, and at the end of the year, they teach mainly about um, uh, the benefits of, of, the, uh, of exercise on the body. And so the classroom teaches, um, just to give you an example, they teach some, uh, some classes on violence prevention, routines for dental care, um, the effects of drugs on the body, 
Um, they may identify the major parts of the ear and in grade four, so they're talking about auditory um, balance and things like that. So beyond that, what else are we doing? Um, I think that it's important to say that two of the goals this year were cultural competency and individualized learning. And I, I think that they're addressing that in many ways. And, and some of those, some of the examples for that could be through um, the Olympics model and uh, having families identify from, identified from different regions and creating flags and hanging them in the gymnasium and, um, you know, doing family nights and individualized learning. We really, we really do address that through fitness grant programs. Um, and um, well, I had another one I think I was thinking of. Um, and maybe through the walking, um, some of the schools have walking paths, so we have pedometers in all the schools so the students can keep data with their, um, their individualized walking. That's about it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. So um, similar to what has been said before, um, our standards are predominantly uh, created from the Common Core originally and then the state's adoption of what those standards were. Um, I don't want to go through every single one of the standards, uh, but I do want to kind of talk about bigger core things that unify all of it together. Um, for me, when I'm thinking about the story that's told throughout all the grades, uh, normally, K-1, you're starting out with counting, uh, some development of place value, simple things like that. It starts to transition in fulcrum in grades 2 and 3 into additive reasoning. When we're thinking about grades 3, 4, and 5, the big core aspect, the big core construct that's being developed there is multiplicative reasoning. It's where the, the child is starting to think about these problems differently. If you transition into fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, you get into proportional reasoning, which adds on to the multiplicative reasoning, and then you start to abstract to some algebraic concepts. So a lot of the content standards that you see here are different ways in which students actually access their development of multiplicative reasoning among the different sets of numbers, whole numbers, uh, fractions, how you might deal with uh, division in those contexts, uh, how it actually relates as an inverse purport, uh, relationship to multiplication. So there's a lot of other standards that might go along with it in the content sense, but these are really those those key aspects that develop that, that core part of it for the students. Uh, throughout the grade four, there's also other content standards, uh, different things in geometry, uh, different aspects of probability and statistics, but again, you'll see those things connected, again, to these main core concepts. Uh, the practice standards, I think, are a big part of what we'd like to shift. We kind of include these as essential standards because, you know, we're trying to really embrace, I think, all of the current research, which is talking about how we actually shift what the classroom looks like and how students actually engage. So you're not only focusing on the standards that you teach, you're also focusing on the connections among those standards and how we actually create a good framing of the class that allows students to see those connections and develop that deeper understanding. So the practice standards are a big part of it for us. Um, I'm not quite sure if you guys are familiar with all the standards of mathematical practice and the state standards. I would definitely recommend reading them. These are three of them that are uh, pretty core and pretty universal. And I think, you know, as kind of talked about before, they really tie nicely to those, to those transferable skills as well, uh, which is really good. Uh, the last little thing, and this kind of echoes something else that was said before, we try to link this structure in both process and content to our progress report as well. We want that to be uh, pretty much a reflection of what we value. Thank you. Bill Papasisis, he's going to actually do the performing arts and then later on he will do the visual arts as well because David Ardito was not able to be here tonight. So in grade four, performing arts uh, is, pretty, is, is pretty much exclusively music instruction. And the, uh, the grade four essential skills are grounded in the Massachusetts arts curriculum framework. And the, uh, the, arts, the arts curriculum framework is organized into two strands. One is content standards, and these are the content standards, content standards for music, singing, reading and notation, playing instruments, improvisation, 
comp composition and critical response. And the other strand are the connection standards, and they are common standards among the arts, and uh, they are also interdisciplinary standards with other content areas such as English language art, uh, ELA, math, science and technology, and world languages. And those skills are developing purposes and meanings in the arts, roles of the artists in communities, uh, style, stylistic influence, and stylistic change, inventions and technologies in the arts, and interdisciplinary connections. And in grade four, the music, uh, the, uh, well, uh, before I get into grade four, just to give a, a little bit of background into, the, uh, into how our music, uh, 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 curriculum is sequenced. It's a um, the elementary curriculum is a is a is a spiral curric is a spiraling curriculum in that uh, students develop proficiencies in primary skill areas, and uh, they continually revisit those skills and are and are introduced to new skills throughout the year and throughout grade level. So they're constantly going back to skills that they've already learned and they are applying them in more complex ways. So that's, that is, so it spirals through the grade levels. And um, at grade four, students are focusing on developing music literacy, music literacy skills while singing and playing instruments. Uh, they're improvising music, which prepares them for learning to compose their own music in later grade levels. Uh, they're beginning to understand the purpose of music and the roles of composers and musicians and cultures, and they apply, they apply knowledge of singing and playing musical instruments as a means of, as a means of, of expression. And uh, it's in grades three and in grade four where our students um, are first introduced to uh, orchestral and, uh, and band instruments through our elementary string and band programs. And uh, we teach these skills at grade four authentically um, in the context of real music. And at grade four, it's through the music of the it's through music of the American regions. And we have three major units: music of the Southwest, going west in America, and American patriotic music. So while students are learning, uh, so while students are learning about the United States in social studies through music, they're getting a glimpse of family life, uh, uh, family culture, uh, culture in the community and cultural, culture in, uh, in various re regions around the United States. In addition, um, in, the, in the American Patriotic uh, Unit, they're developing a sense of nationality and nationalism through, uh, through uh, music and a sense of, uh, 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 a sense of nat nationality as, as Americans. And are we doing visual arts? Not right now. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Larry Weathers for science. Hi. Thank you for allowing us to share our journeys. We know that they're your journeys, too, in all the ways that you support us and, and the programs. We have our, our new standards in science. We're excited about it, but when you look at them as is, they're dense, and for the typical elementary school teacher uh, they, they don't, who is not trained in science, they are sometimes daunting when in a typical hands-on experiment, sometimes it doesn't always go right. And so it takes a little longer, uh, and sometimes the teachers were frustrated with where do we go. So we started culling some of the parts, not, not by taking them out of the FOSS standards, but by uh, focusing on the ones that are essential. So I've, I've highlighted a few words here in the content standards just to map them through the next slide, if you would go on, please. So here's an example of a FOSS unit in fourth grade, environments. And you can see the uh, highlighted words from the practices are right here enlarged. And so those indicate where we, we are introducing the practice standards of you know, observing and designing and all those kinds of active verbs. The red lettering is, well, we, the process we used was we had our elementary science leaders in the elementary buildings go and do a one-to-one -one mapping of all the activities and the standards covered in those activities to the Massachusetts standards. And we found that there was plenty of duplication. 
So we wanted to make sure that there were essential ones, and those are the ones in this unit that are in black that were always covered. And then as time allowed, we would go on to the red ones, you know, and, and who wouldn't want to, as a fourth grader, grow brine shrimp or uh, do a water or salt tolerance in plants experiment. Those are fun things and engaging things, and hopefully our teachers will get to those, but when they can't, they can at least do the essential standards, and uh, whether they are the content standards or the practice standards. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Sarah Bird for social emotional learning. Hello. I have the uh, wonderful pleasure of talking about social emotional learning, but you're going to notice that I've also pulled in some of the um, Ask a School standards for school counseling because I also wear that other hat, and the two of them are very closely related. So we have uh, the benefits of social emotional learning is if we were to cut a slice at fourth grade, uh, the competencies are going to look the same at every grade level, whether it's pre-K through 12, because the five core competencies are going to remain the same throughout. Those are the self-awareness, the self-management, self-regulation. Um, I'm sorry, self-management should say self-regulation. Nope, nope, yeah, no, it's totally, yeah, it should be self-regulation. That's okay, no, that was probably me. Um, responsible decision-making and relationship skills, those are those five CASEL standards which the district's using. And you take those in combination with our Massachusetts state frameworks, and believe it or not, we do have PKK state standards in social-emotional learning. Um, they're working on developing them further through early elementary and so on. That's going to take a number of years. So they've also worked on guidance on how to integrate and embed the social-emotional learning competencies with the frameworks, and I've taken some of them to, to the right to show you there. Then there's the Ask a National Standards, which is the American School Counselors Association. And we have a number of um, developmentally appropriate standards that are very similar to the SHAPE standards that Cindy spoke about with um, health and PE. And so they've developed them further. And then the mindsets and skills are what they break it down into sort of subcategories, growth mindset, fixed mindset, and different behaviors that you want students to develop over time. So if you take the ASK standards, if you take the social emotional learning competencies and you start to look at the cross section, Massachusetts has done us some favors by starting to talk about what are the guiding principles then when we really look to embed this into our academic work, what should it look like? So I've included up on the slide the math and literacy guiding principles from the most recent iterations of the state frameworks. Um, they do a really lovely job talking about how none of this work is possible if we are addressing standards and mechanics separate from the social emotional learning competencies that our young people have. So it talks about, you can see down um, at the the bottom, which is the, yes, that's the, the literacy one is the second one, and it even talks about looking for themselves in the texts and trying to find how do they struggle productively without burning out, how do they de develop that reading stamina and so on, um, trying to deal with the choices, just thinking about what Linda was talking about when she gave her examples too. There's a really beautiful fusion between those. So part of what our goals are for the district is we have this guidance from the state, but how do we now map that out onto our own Arlington Public Schools scope and sequence in terms of curriculum maps? How do we help teachers to see intentionally when you're working on these units in your math and in your literacy and your science, where are there opportunities for you to be intentional about um, self-awareness, practice, opportunities for teaching it explicitly, but also practicing it while it's embedded in the content there. So that's really all I have to say about social emotional learning. Thank Thanks. You. So Denny already went uh, regarding social studies. So we have Bill Papasitsis. He's going to come back and talk about visual arts. So at the fourth grade in visual arts, students um, are beginning um, a, a new process. They're introduced to a new process ca uh, called Teaching for Art Artistic Behavior, or TAB. And it's a nationally recognized choice-based approach to teaching art. And it was developed here in Massachusetts uh, by researchers and educators at the, at the Mass College of Art. And TAB regards students as artists um, and offers them authentic choices for responding to their ideas through art making. The focus is on the creative process and how students come to realize their ideas in personalized and innovative ways 
using a variety of media and materials. And so the, the, uh, the emphasis is more on, on, the, on the creative process than it is on the, on the actual final product. What's important is how students use those ideas to get to that, to, to get to that final stage. And uh, throughout this process, students are engaged in developing skills uh, articulated again in the, Mass uh, in the Massachusetts uh, arts curriculum framework, specifically for the visual arts. And those standards are, uh, those content standards are demonstrating and applying knowledge of materials and methods and techniques, understanding and applying the elements and principles of design, uh, applying skills in observation, ab abstraction, invention, and expression to develop meaning in their work, apply knowledge in drafting, revising, and revisit revisiting to refine their work, and, uh, and developing skills in critical thinking and critical response, along with those four common standards that I, that I meant, those, co those common uh, interdis interdisciplinary st standards that I mentioned earlier. And in this next slide, um, it, and if you were to go into a, um, a tab organized classroom, you would see six uh, media stations. And uh, so students have a choice, have up to six choices of media to develop their, um, their artistic ideas. And here we have two stations. One is collage and the other looks like fiber arts. Now we're gonna go into some examples uh, Part of the goal for 1.1 is to look at examples of personalized learning. And so we're going to have Matt Coleman talk about computer science. And just to let you know, he had other pictures on there. And my preparation for the slides, I, well, there are some certain pictures that aren't there because of me. So I, I took full responsibility for that. Huh? I haven't passed this course yet. That's right. <laughs> It was awesome, trust me. Um, so I'm actually gonna be back here in two weeks talking about computer science. So I'm gonna keep this pretty short and just kind of keep it to the, the personalized learning. Uh, we've been proud, I've been really proud of all the work that we've done six through 12 with a lot of um, opportunities for our students and it's gonna be increasing as well. Uh, a lot of opportunities, specifically in this case computer science, for students to really put their stamp on their own projects and their own learning, uh, which is awesome. Not quite sure if you've had a chance to see a lot of the, the things that have come out of that sixth grade course and some of the projects that have come out of some of our high school stuff. Um, even though the core of the project and the expectations from the teacher are somewhat similar for all the students, the, the personalization, the, the tailoring that the students actually do for these projects are just awesome. So this instance right here, um, I did have other pictures, but in this instance, this was just a game where uh, students, if you were to play this, um, this particular project had a lot of different aesthetics, a lot of different neat little bells and whistles that uh, the students added on, which is really nice. Uh, again, I'll talk more about it uh, next in, in two weeks, but this is, uh, yeah, it's really good stuff. And then, uh, Larry Webb is gonna come back and talk about the extracurricular activities and uh, how they're delving into personalized learning. Hi again. Uh, personalized learning is one of those things that's a little hard for defi to define, and we're still struggling a little bit with that, or to put the boundaries on it. <coughs> and, um, but it's one of those things that you know it when you see it, and it comes in a lot of subtle ways. And we have a lot of ways that it's introduced in all of the buildings of our district. Um, Here's an example of, a, of an extracurricular activity, the robotics club, one that I'm familiar with. And what I, those bullets that you see there are back from one of the original slides of this slideshow called the transferable skills. And so we're trying to loop back and see how even in an extracurricular, we're, we're bringing in those transferable skills. The kids have to uh, do a journal about their thinking about building this robot. And when something goes wrong, they have to talk about why it w didn't work and what their next step was. Uh, obviously, there's creativity and imagination and critical thinking, and there's some other dot behind that picture. I don't remember what it is, but, oh, digital literacy. Yes, and because all of this involves programming, and no one's an expert. None of, none of the team members are an expert here, 
they work together as a collaborative group, which is another layer of skills. So uh, we have lots of other ways, lots of, if you look in on the, um, on the school building websites, there are 60 or 70 extracurricular activities, high school, middle school, some at the elementary, uh, some like um, uh, the math team, science fair, robotics, journalism, music technology, gaming, science olympiads, peer leaders, the, and, and that's just a few examples. And those are all things that kids choose to do because they're passionate about that area. That's a personal learning. And uh, we also offer MOOCs and Coursera. And we have had over 50 MOOC and Coursera courses where, where kids take uh, topics like astrophysics and relativity or feminism or uh, philosophy. And they go through a, a regular college course, uh, a shortened, abbreviated one, after school with, a, with one of our teachers in, in guidance and uh, guiding them. And uh, so there's, there are a lot of ways that we introduce personalized learning, both in our classes through individualized kind of instructional techniques, standardized grading, et cetera, as well as in our extracurricular activity program. Thank you. And then we have Bill Papasisis, who's going to come up and talk about personalized learning through visual arts. <laughs> he has a lot of hats tonight, yes. So we have two examples of, 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 middle, school, uh, of middle school students' art, uh, artwork uh, that um, through which uh, they had to um, express um, ideas or um, their feelings about either a personal issue, a personal event in their lives, or a social issue or event um, um, uh, that's, that's happening um, in, their, uh, in their life. And uh, so through their artwork, they're, they're doing a lot, of self, a lot of really important self-expression, particularly at the middle school. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a multimedia work. It's paint and printmaking. Uh, uh, the painting, of course, is the uh, is the the the, the, color, the rainbow colorful part, and the printmaking are those are stamps that that students have made from another material and have stamped on there uh, uh, into the work. And um, I think the the quote is written by the student. The students had to write about uh, about what they were expressing, and um, I, it, it's pretty poignant. Uh, uh, the event I based this piece on was when I went into a downward spiral of emotions. I got help, and I suddenly, and suddenly, a big weight was lifted off my shoulders. This is important to me because it is now an inspiration to move forward, and to never stop trying. I used a whole rainbow of colors to represent the place I am trying to reach. I carved an umbrella as my stamp to represent the hard times I went through. I am very proud of this piece. In the second work by a seventh grader, uh, this is also a multimedia piece painting and, uh, and painting and printmaking. Uh, the event I chose is the women's rights movement. Women deserve to be equal to men no matter what. We are humans too. I, rep I represented this event by making my monoprint all black. The black represents the fight for women's rights and that we are angry. I also use striking pink, red, and purple for my stamp because these colors are stereotypical women's colors. These were used to prove that stereotyping is wrong by using reverse psychology. Right. So. so that does conclude our presentation. Hopefully you're able to see how some of the things that we talked about in the vision statement and in the transferable skills, you can see them as they're integrated into each one of the uh, essential standards as we're, look, we're talking about content in each one of the disciplines. So you'll see how this all comes together. We start with the end in mind. These are the characteristics that we like students, we would like students to have as they matriculate through the grades and eventually graduate. These are the transferable skills that we need to, we need to focus on within our instruction. And those transferable skills also 
influence how we're instructing students. And then you'll see the content standards that we're focusing on. And even though we're focusing on the content, the way that we're instructing is incorporating and integrating those transferable skills with the end in mind that this is where we want our students to be at the end of their academic careers here in Arlington. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, did you want to add anything? Well, I hope that this gives the community and the school committee an, an, a window into the kind of thinking and planning that this group so strategically does all the time. Um, I think that one of the things that we found is we really delve in doing this work well, that this is a multi-year goal. There's just, as you can see, the level of um, depth here it just requires more thought. So the, the hope is that we're going to, uh, not the hope, but the plan is that we're going to do this for every grade level. Um, already at the secondary level, we have, we do have co course oversights and curriculum maps. What, what we'll probably do over the next year or so is become more explicit about the transferable skills that exist in each one of the courses. But I, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that everybody's been doing with this. Um, it's, it's important. Other districts are doing the same thing. They're actually, it's, it's strategic planning. It's really understanding how we develop in a school district a, a, a coherency and, uh, of the curriculum and what our goals are for the graduate. And, and I, this has been great work, work that we've talked about and for a couple of years, and, and now we're really moving forward with it. But as I said, it is work that is going to be multiple years. So when we come back to district goals, you're going to see this as being, a, a, you know, a continued focus uh, for next year and probably the year after that as well. And I just thank want to, to everybody. And I, and I want to thank all the curriculum leaders who took time out of their busy schedules to come tonight uh, and our uh, directors. And as you can see, curriculum instruction is in very good hands. We have a, a very talented and thoughtful and reflective group of individuals who are able to work together because this also takes a lot of collaboration and integration as you see as, as some of the uh, departments such as ELA and social studies are working together to create units. And so as we look at the, uh, the transferable skills and look at where we want our students to be, there's a lot of talk about what's going on. And so we want to continue that type of a conversation between each one of the departments and disciplines so that we can get to where we want to be and which is reflected in the vision statement. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Uh, well, so comment first. Um, excellent work. Um, the um, transferable skills especially feel to me like spot on, you know, just really very carefully thought out and just spot on. Um, I enjoyed seeing incidents of student work. That's always really exciting. We have some really talented students. Um, but here's my question. <laughs> uh, the vision of students as learners and global citizen has beneath it um, characteristics, which are similar to but not exactly the same as the transferable skills. And I'm wondering what you see as a relationship between those two. So as we were contemplating, and, and again, I want to also emphasize the fact that as we were working through the vision statement, we were also taking in feedback from the community. So we're looking at, you know, like from community groups such as Vision 2020. Um, but I think that, you know, you are going to see some overlap there. And, and that, you know, as we're looking at the, how, as, how students are learning, what are some of the things that we want them to be able to do beyond the classroom? So this is not just looking at what they're able to do within the classroom and learning the content, but we're looking at these are the things that we feel that you're going to need to be able to do outside of the four walls of this school and of any school. So we're looking at this, and it, so you're going to see some overlap in some of the language. Uh, but at the end, we feel like these statements, like for instance, if you look at um, you know, bullet number two, or, and, and bullet number three, as Matt was talking about the math practices, there's going to be some overlap there, like when you're talking about perseverance. So we are utilizing that, those resources as we talked about, as Deb talked about before, as we're looking at the content, we're looking at the standards, we're looking at other resources to say, and we didn't just come up with these you know, in a vacuum, like we utilize multiple resources. So you're going to see some overlap 
but you know, as it, so I can't really say that they're all going to be totally different in language, but these are the characteristics we want our students to have. So some of those transferable skills are going to be evidenced in the statements. Um, I think that's a, a really good explanation, but I would add one, one other thing, sure. and that is when we looked at this as the end goal of what we'd like to see all students, the, the question everyone should be asking is how do you get there? And so you go back and you look at the transferable skills, but they lead up to these kinds of um, portraits that we want to have goals for us, for the graduate, but then how do you develop the transferable skills? Then that goes back to each, each of the curriculum areas and where does that, where are we doing that? And then how does that all relate K-12 and, and have this vertical um, progression? So um, you're right, it's not exactly the same wording, but it wasn't intended to be the same wording. Right. And I would also add, we also, uh, th this was also brought to the CPAC group as well during the Absolutely. course of the year. Yes. Um, so we, we're we bringing it to you at this point because you, you, we would like your comments on this. Um, at some point, I don't know if it'll be this June or it'll be next fall, but it would be great to say, you know, school committee say, you know, we really endorse this vision. And it's, it's not, a, it's not a, um, a fixed vision either. It's something that will be dynamic as we go forward, certainly, as you can see, the number of times some of us have gone through curriculum changes at the state level, that's going to keep going because all this evolves and we will evolve with it, um, maybe even evolve ahead of it in some cases as, as you've heard tonight. So um, it's a process, but I think that for all of us, we needed the um, that sort of the intellectual integrity of what we're doing to be visible to everybody else. We, and we also want to use this as a guide as we think about instruction. So as I said before, like this influences how we instructional design, the activities that we have students participate in. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask ourselves, is this, is this going to lead us to this particular goal? Mm -hmm. So hopefully, I, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for your work. Once again, a small part of me wants to come back to teach, not with the excitement of what you're bringing. Quick question, is, have you built in uh, an assessment element for what works? Sometimes when you do all this work and stuff, it looks really great, and then when you try to implement it, the kids, it falls flat with the kids, and sometimes I don't think any of this is going to, but I mean, is there an assessment element built into the, in, what you've done? Absolutely, I mean, there's unit assessments in various of the content areas. Uh, there's teacher observation, um, and also t teachers can, you know, get together on early release, uh, we have, uh, they have CPT time where they meet, and so they can talk about, you know, lesson planning. They can talk about, you know, how did the lesson go, and so that's where those adjustments will come in. Um, and so, so like, like uh, Larry said, it's like sometimes you'll do an experiment or you'll do something and it'll fall flat, and so, you know, that's, the, that's where the learning comes in, and we say, so how can we tweak this to make it more interesting and more engaging? So, yes, so it's a, it's a constant iterative process. Uh, lesson planning, looking at the standards. So, yes, that, those type of conversations do take place. And we also have, you know, early release. We have department uh, where they have just this past Tuesday, where the department meeting. So they meet with the teachers and they talk about, you know, curriculum um, and uh, instruction, and talk about lesson planning. Ms. Morgan. Um, I think this was great. I really appreciated hearing all about this because a lot of it's new to me. Um, I think what, as you continue to work through this, what I would love to see eventually is some way that this can be sort of tangibly messaged out to to parents mm -hmm. and because it's super duper interesting what's happening and some of us have kids who come home from school and and report every single thing they did that day and some of us have kids who report nothing and it was super I had a fourth grader last year and I was like who knew they like did all this stuff with immigration like I had no idea but I'm sure that she does and so if there's some way that we can, because because people aren't going to listen, like your presentation was phenomenal, but people aren't going to watch an hour, right? I know, I know, it's terrible. They should, oh my goodness. Right? right? But they're not, they're not going to. So if we're we're all 
you know, you guys are educators, we're very interested in it. If we can think of, of ways to take the, because so often when people bring me concerns about their kids in school, um, the, my, my response is, well, like, I kind of think it's happening. You just haven't heard about it. Mm. Right. And so, um, I would love to think about ways to take this and make it so that it's, it's more accessible for people mm -hmm. who want to look at, you know, mm -hmm. fourth grade or whatever. We feel the same way. And I think they'll be disappointed to hear that, that nobody would want to listen to it for now. By the way, we will, <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we will ask ACMI to see if we can get that on the, on the, on the, um, the website nonetheless. But you're absolutely right. This is one of the, the things that we're working on. We would like to have um, the curriculum accessible to parents so that you can go into um, an area and, and really see the essential standards. I think you, if you'd be overwhelmed if you saw all of the standards. In fact, if people go to the DESE website and look at the standards, they're going to be amazed. So we've had to try to, we're trying to find out what is the most important that we really need to focus on. It doesn't mean we're not going to do other things, but these are the core, and we want parents to know what those are. So yes, that is, and I think as we go along, we just start creating that website. Of course, the problem is if you put just the fourth grade up there, <laughs> yeah. fifth grade parents are gonna wanna know what, what the, right. you know, all these different grades. So I'll look to some uh, advice from all of you as to whether we just do it iteratively or we just wait till it's all done. Mr. Hainer? Just real quick, the, all the words were wonderful, but those last three or four pictures were really powerful. <coughs> showing that all, all that work and, and, and the direction and the end result. So part of this thing, couple with the pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your hard work and presentation. Um, so when I th saw the original goal, um, and it, you know, it sounded like a great idea. I didn't quite know what it was getting at, but it sounded like a good idea, so we went with it. Um, as, it as we've evolved, I think you know, the vision <laughs> ended up having these list of characteristics, which I'm not sure was what we originally thought. And there's a lot of overlap between the characteristics and the transferable skills. And you can kind of see where they, where they fit in. What I, what I don't see, though, is the roadmap of everything else. So, you know, Dr. Bodhi just talked about how we, we want to see how, we want to get our kids to have these characteristics, to have these transferable skills and these characteristics. But, and, and you've got a lot of, uh, of curriculum items, but I don't see how those map to those, either the transferable skills or the, um, the characteristics and the vision. So I'd like, you know, as you evolve this and as you roll it out to other grades, I'd like to see that alignment more, and I'd like to see those tied in a bit more together. So, um, you know, when I look at the, the first one, work independently and collaboratively, I don't know how fourth graders will get that characteristic. Um, from, from, from what you presented so far. Well, we, we, we try to share like specific lessons as Linda pointed out in hers where she gave examples and, and you know, Larry gave examples of right. the so science. If you, numbered, if you numbered these and you said this example is for 1A and this okay. example gets us to 1B, that, that would help tie it all in together better. Sure, we can definitely provide examples of you know, specific lessons mm -hmm. and then have, you know, I, identify which one of those transferable yeah. skills or um, characteristics are, are exhibited Great. in that particular lesson. So we can do that, absolutely. Great, thank you. So, that, so it looks like you're asking for like examples, yes. I'm just gonna jump in. I don't know that we can. Can, she, can you, you come, come to, to the, the mic? mic? Oh, the mic, right, right. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm very tempted to follow a linear progression, you know, of an equation A plus B equals C. Um, especially for my work, though, when we're talking about competencies that cut through, I could tag everything, and then you'd end up with social-emotional learning tags on every standard that's across the board. So I put that back out to you to ask a question of, if linear is too messy and, and weighed down and convoluted, is there another satisfying way <coughs> that we can map things together or pull them together? Because I know, especially for my content, I'm not going to be able to do that for you in a way that's satisfying if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's another document that we didn't share tonight was the one that actually takes one of the, um, the, co the content learning standards of, of, show, of writing uh, 
um, piece of work with evidence, and they actually have done something exactly like that, mapping out, you know, by um, grade levels what that looks like in different disciplines. And um, I think it's a good point, and I think the challenge will be to see how to express this in a way that makes sense for everybody. Those that work in, the, in this, it makes sense to them. But then how do you create a document that's not pages and pages and pages mm -hmm. that makes sense to everybody else? So it's a good point, and let's look at that a little bit more and maybe show you that, that at another time. So there's a document in there, 9 through 12. It, I, I have to give you, uh, apologize, the, the, the writing or the text is very small, but I oh. can give you... Uh, one that's more readable. <laughs> yes, yes. I you know, sometimes when you when you upload fun. things into Novus, like that. <laughs> upload things into Novus, it yeah. changes, and I oh, wasn't yeah. aware of that. So that's yeah. you know, being the newbie, that's probably. Or you can send it to us as we as a sure. I can file. do that. Then we can make it bigger. And that and that is what Dr. Bodie is referring to. And there's another one in there is a transferable skills grades three through five, oh, and so. That one didn't even make it. I just pulled it up, and that's not what it's supposed to look like. So I can okay. follow up with that because mm -hmm. um, I tried to put it as part of the supporting materials, but obviously it didn't make it because of formatting difficulties. Mr. Weathers? The, the new science standards, when they were being researched and decided upon, were based on... Um, a whole set of documents called learning progressions, where you, you, you look at what kids need to do and learn before they can learn the next concept. And that walks uh, people through how that is developed across grades K through 12. Uh, the problem is if you look at that online even, to go to one end of it to the other end of it is about a minute's worth of scrolling. So it's not a document that's easily viewed. It, it's there, and you can look at parts of it if you want, and that's available through a link, and I can get that link for you. So, okay, thank you. So I wonder, um, it feels like it's, it's too much of a burden and maybe not helpful to do, to make those connections for every single grade level at every single subject. But um, it might be sort of interesting and, and fun to just take an example and maybe annotate it. Because that can so often, like, just as an example, oh, so here's one of the lessons that is particularly rich that sort of gets at lots of different things and sort of draw little circles and do that kind of thing as just an example. And then, but not have to do it for everything, but just as an idea. Or you can start there and see, see if it feels perspicuous. Um, I have one nitpicky point. The only thing that I read that sounded off to me is this um, demonstrate perseverance by re using repeated reasoning and inquiry. This is one of the third bullet under um, vision of student as learner because it seems like perseverance is a really important trait that we want um, students to have and that there are many ways to persevere. And this sort of feels like it's saying there's sort of these are the only two ways to persevere, repeatedly applying reasoning and inquiry rather than maybe trying a different tactic or, um, you know, approaching things, you know, around, you know, something like that. It just, you know, there's, there's sort of many different kinds of ways to persevere. So, so what I would like to do, and, and this is why, you know, presenting the vision statement to you, and as Dr. Bodhi said, we're looking for your feedback, so mm -hmm. that would be very helpful if you could put that in writing, then send it to us. Sure. But as a collective group, I don't know how that would work uh, of all I, of you. I know, I, yeah. I, I know I've sent things from before, and I know that this has been a long process. I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. But uh, again, if you send that to me uh, in an email, that because you know, I'm not documented, but I could definitely keep that in mind, and we can revisit and look at that, that particular bullet. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had just a couple, well, actually, one question um, about ELA. Um, this is okay. So this is maybe reflecting on our family's experience and may not relate to this because it sounds like things have been changing. But I'm thinking about the uh, where you talked about the literary literary essay. Yeah. And what I'm wondering is how much of the work that's being discussed 
is done in class and how much of the work, if any, is expected to be done at home? And if it's expected to be done at home, what are the resources that the parents are given or you know, that the student can access from home to get to the end of you know, the project end? And I'm just, we had, I remember sitting with my daughters at various times trying to do things and feeling like we didn't have the resources that I think we really needed to get to what it seemed like maybe the end of the, the desired goal point was. And I'm just wondering if things have changed or you know, if that's being thought about at all. You know, kind of where is the information coming and where the, where's the product expected to be being created? Does, so it sounds. So you're specifically talking about the literary essay unit. Just as an example. But, as an example. Yeah. But, so I would but, say, you know, a lot of, you know, the the district approach to it is to provide the curriculum and the professional development, and then how it exactly gets rolled out in each school and within with each teacher can sometimes be individualized for that situation. But in general, I would say the bulk of all of this. Learning happens in the classroom setting. You know, all of the reading and writing workshop um, units are set up in such a way that there's, you know, a similar format. There's a mini lesson and then there's independent work time and teachers are working one-on-one -on -one <coughs> with individual students or small groups of students and they're, they use a mentor text to kind of teach the skills and then there's active engagement and then the kids are doing their own kind of work independently following along what they've learned together as a whole class. So... So um, it sounds like ours were running a little bit ahead of when this stuff was ramping through, because I, I know that that's true for some of the um, types of uh, approaches that we've been doing. And the writing units have been around a little bit longer than the reading units. The reading units are newer um, to the district in terms of our rolling out of them. So I think it depends a little bit. And then there's always individual variation from time to time. But um, OK. I think that answers my question. I mean, it sounds like it's being done more in the classroom and less expectation that the product's supposed to occur with whatever the kids picked up and, you know, having doing it at home. And I guess what I'm saying is just that I think this is something that for parents, if we're expected, if our children are expected to be doing something to standards that maybe they didn't quite catch or something that it's really helpful for us to have resources at home, either that they've been handed or that we can access online or, or something so that we can help them because otherwise you're <coughs> sitting there and it's just not pretty. And, and I would say as a, you know, kind of with my district lens on, we'd be more than happy to support that if that comes back up to us as a, as a desire and, and a need. So if, if that kind of okay are you saying you think parents need to explain more if they're having problems like this sure like the, i this is the first time i'm personally hearing about it so if you know if that's a concern that kind of goes back to the teacher and back to the principal and comes to the okay. curriculum leader okay. we'd be more than happy to support principals and teachers um to be able to better help you know with resources okay. to help the parents okay um Ms. morgan my, I think my experience, because my kids are a little bit younger, is that the, they, they bring very little home anymore, which is great because yeah. can't, I can't help them. <laughs> um, so what they do bring home is, is like there are certain projects, but they're, like, they're really clearly okay. like so that's laid good. out. That's, so so it's I, my it's kids changed. are not coming right. home with sort of any kind of vast writing or stuff that okay. they're needing to do on my okay. watch, which Good. has been my experience. Okay, so that's great. And it, it sounds like it's changed. And that's, the thing is we don't know where and when the changes have happened. Okay, so that was, and we'll see if we hear anything else like at coffees or whatever about this, but right. yeah. Send um, it our way. Right, um, and then the other question is just, it sounded like you're thinking that you can have this done in three years. I guess I'm, I'm thinking this is great, but it's one grade and we've got 12 and, or 13 if you count pre-K. Um, and 
I'm just worried how long it's going to take to get to a final product. Then, yeah. Well, actually, we're meeting tomorrow to actually explore <coughs> that question. The, the elementary is a little bit different than the secondary because there's, um, as I said, at the secondary level, there are course descriptions. Not that there aren't for elementary, but uh, there are curriculum maps. And so it's a, uh, how those get um, updated is another issue. And it's, but I think the elementary piece is the one that we're really focusing on right now just because of, of how we want to see everything integrated and um, vertically aligned from those grades on. But that's a, it's a great question, and I think that's what we're going to grapple with tomorrow is really what's realistic um, with everybody's time. And of course, next year there's even going to—you know—we we're a growing district, and we are going to have another school next year. And so there's a lot of a uh, lot of things that everybody is working on, and this is important. But then there's also the, the, the everyday work. So uh, it's a great question, and I'll let you know when we present on the 10th what we can think we can do. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation and your time, thank you. everyone's. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. So moving on, uh, monthly financial report. Thank you. <clears throat> well, as you see, there's not much change this month from, from last month in the general fund. Uh, there's some ups and downs in certain areas as we continue to uh, review encumbrances and, and add some and, and uh, liquidate some. Uh, the balance goes up and down a little bit. We're, we're making it to sort of a milestone this week or at the end of this month because we will uh, sort of put a stop on our purchase orders for a little bit so we can try to uh, better predict where we're going to end the year. Uh, so we'll do, we'll do that for a couple weeks, go through all the purchase orders again, get a better idea of where we stand and, and uh, try, to, try to make a good prediction for where we're going to in the year and then decide whether we're going to add some purchase orders or if we need to, in fact, uh, cancel some that we already have. As far as grants and revolving um, go, you, we may see the, nothing has really changed for this report. You may see a little bit of a change uh, next month because April, May time frame is when you usually hear if you're getting a little bit of bump in the entitlement grants. Um, I know that we are in uh, the 240 grant, a small bump, but it won't, it won't hit the report until it's actually processed in Munis, which is after we get the award letter, uh, so that the timing may not work out to be before next Monday, but certainly by the time we report, we'll be able to say what that bump is. Uh, and in the revolving accounts, we'll, we're, we're tracking right on with, with uh, where they were last year uh, for each of them in the revenue area. Um, this is about the, the only one that's that uh, seems like it's behind is the foreign visa, and that has to do with the, just the timing of the receipts. Um, so we may talk a little bit about that next month because we should start seeing more of, of the uh, receipts for next year's payments that, that come in now, between now and the end of June. Um, and if we get what we, similar to what we got last year, we're not going to have a problem there either. But uh, the next couple of weeks will give us more data to just uh, by the next time we present get closer. So we're... As you expect, as we get closer to the end of the year, we get closer to being able to estimate where we are. We don't expect to have um, a deficit. That's awesome. Um, Mr. Hainer. Do we have any word on circuit breaker? Uh, nothing official, but it all looks good that the fourth quarter bump will be um, pretty pretty significant. Okay. okay. So as soon as we, we – actually, we should probably hear before, right after the conference committee comes out. Time and why it doesn't have anything. It's not tied to that, but right. um, that's what they project the predicted when we'd find out for sure. But it looks positive. It was, appro it was approved, and governor has to sign it. But um, nothing, nothing definitive of what that number is going to be. Yeah, the, the Senate just acted on it today. Yeah. So, Ms. Morgan. Um, so I have two new questions, and we can do them one at a time. So as I read this report and I come down to that bottom, like, 4819 number, right? So that is the amount of money that – because, like, 
So, so I re I understand that in my like non financial head. So I see all of these like budget line items, right? That mm -hmm. jump around significantly, right? Some are like up twenty five thousand dollars. Some are like down forty two thousand dollars. And then like at the end of the day, I see like five grand in the corner. And is that like the the difference? For, like out of a sixty million dollar budget of effect. like where we actually are, which is like extremely close, like so unfathomably. Because you look at some of these line items, you're like, this isn't going well. Oh, this is going great, and then but you come down to the end of the day, and it's like five thousand dollars. Yeah, there's a there's a lot in the calculation. So what we've either spent, encumbered, or are projecting to spend spend ninety nine point nine nine two percent of the budget. That's probably what the math works out to be. Um, but that's also, we know what we've spent, we know what we have encumbrances for, but then we also, there's a column there that says projected encumbrances. That's what we, what we think we're going to spend from now to the end of the year that just hasn't been encumbered yet. So that's sort but of But you're the, not like making that number up to make this other number really close. Correct. Right? So it just happens to be, I'm not. Well, they go up and down. <laughs> They, right. They down I just month. can't believe that it's. I mean, I believe it, but like, I'm just. <laughs> I'm super. No, I'm super impressed that it's that. I'd be like, willing to bet that's not going to be the number at the at very okay. end. Okay. <laughs> All right, but it just seems very. It seems much smaller to me than I would thought. And my second question is: is that you said before that that we're going to stop POs, we're going to stop purchase orders. Does that mean we're going to stop buying things? Oh, what like, what is that? Like, what does that mean? Because I feel like, as like a former PTO person, I felt like we always kind of knew, like, come March, that like, you know, what were like, what were we going to take on to like get us over the finish line? Is this like we actually? Anyway, what does that mean? So it doesn't mean we're not going to buy anything else. It just means we're going to we're going to take a break from adding new orders unless it's something that's an emergency and sort of. Um, recalibrate where we are, see what the validity of this number is, up or down, to then to then release, uh, to more scrutinize all the purchase orders and say, do we really need this this year? The validity of what number? The validity of each like line budget line. The bottom line. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. And and how? So, but like so up until now the PO system has been like roughly open and now it's closed. Like, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. Y yes, it's been open the, the whole year and it will still be open. It's just what we're trying to do is just take a break on putting them in, get all your orders that you know you're going to order in for now, but before now, so that we know this is what you think you're going to order for the rest of the year. So we can try to see where we're going to close it. out the budget. Okay. And then we know things are going to come up. And there's going to be stuff that has a purchase order that we say, oh, you know what, we're not going to do that. So there's too many moving parts, but for now we get to take a snapshot, you know, uh, whatever it is, 10 months through the year to say, okay, uh, we have a pretty good idea of where we're going to be. We don't think there's any big problems or, oh, we do have a big problem and this is, how, this is what we're going to do to fix it. Okay, thank you. Oh, so this is how I think it works, and so maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong, <laughs> um, that there are certain categories of things that were we to have some problems, we mm -hmm. could defer those expenses, right? Yep. So that's why the numbers come out so neatly, because things like instructional materials, for example, which are in need, but they could be deferred a few months if we absolutely had to, right? right. So, okay. so there's just some categories like that, you know, then. then. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No. Yeah. Um. Oh. You answered my question about the uh, the foreign visas. The other um, expense, the other revenue account that was a little bit short was the um, the tuition in, like twenty thousand, twenty four thousand. Is that uh, going to be a small shortfall, or is that still coming in? Uh, so we, we'll, we're going to have to look at that again. We 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 have been talking about it to see uh, because we mm. we're trying to look at exactly last year what made up the amount for last year because we're. In one of the areas, we're actually doing a little bit better than we did last year. So we're just going to have to try to figure out if that's a timing thing, too, or if there may be a little bit of a shortfall there. Okay. And then the other, just to, to confirm I'm reading this right, the, the preschool fee surplus um, is not the 29000 It has not been applied anywhere. Correct. So that's available if right. we need it. Great. Right. Thank you. The thinking is if we have to open a new class next year and there was some surplus this year, we could. Or, or it could help a, a potential problem somewhere else. Okay. Thanks. And yes, we do have to open another class next year. <laughs> Anyone else? No? When you said milestone, I thought you meant we weren't going to have any more snow. 
but <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on, uh, superintendent report. Yes. Well, there's quite a few things um, this evening. Uh, first of all, I'm going to address our building projects, as I always do, and and I wanted the committee and actually those people who are um, watching tonight to see the report that we submitted to MSBA, <laughs> I can barely hold it, um, yesterday. Yes. So, this so is, how is that balanced? This is our, huh? well. That's one copy. Yeah, that's one, one copy. copy. This yeah, is you didn't bind copy. it. You just sort of no. <laughs> put a rubber band around it. Um, I put a rubber, right, right. I'm not even, we're going to have, this is our first. Now, I don't think any of the ones that will be subsequent will be quite this, um, um, that's many reports. But this is the significance of the work that has gone on over the last, really, six months. It's been significant. A lot of reports in here. Um, you know, all of this can be available to people um, as we go forward. And we will make it available to everybody. All right. So one of the things we did not have time for last um, meeting, and I, and I want to take a little time here because there are people who have not been able to get to the forum or may not be on the website. And I just think that any opportunity we have to really talk about what's going on with the building project is worthwhile. Because this is a major project that's, that is going to affect everybody in town um, in, in many different ways. And where we, where we are, because I think there's still uh, some, um, a little confusion as to what the process is. And hopefully uh, I can um, clarify that and maybe questions that you might have and of course uh, Dr. Allison Ampey who is also on the building committee can tag team with me on this. What we are, what we are now is we, we have selected uh, four options to further study. As you recall a couple, um, about a month ago we had a, a community forum in which there were eight options. And a lot of people were confused about this. They thought this was what the schools were going to look like at the end. And that's not what they're going to look like at the end, other than the fact that if you had columns still on it to, to mimic column house, you know what that looks like. But these were really designs in terms of big massing ideas. Um, and they fell into really broad categories of whether you kept Fusco House and column house, whether you built behind of the high school, whether you built in front of the high school, how did you? How could we deal with um, phasing so that we might have create some swing space? And so, after putting this out to the public and and also a lot of discussion at the building committee, we've come down to four more options to study in more depth over the next uh, two months. Now, what does studying it mean? Because that's also it means that we're going to take a look um, more closely at how phasing, for example, how, how much longer would one project take over another project in terms of getting, in, in terms of construction? Um, what are pros and cons of the construction? Could we create um, enough swing space to minimize the number of modulars? The one thing that we won't do a lot more than we've already done is what are the cost comparisons? because this is not the stage you really get into that level of detail because you don't have the level of detail to actually cost it out. What the best we can really do at this stage is to get the number of square feet in each option and to apply an industry number to those square feet to at least get a relative comparison. So the numbers that have been floating out there, you know, 283,000 or 311,000, those are just numbers related to the number of square feet. Um, until we actually get much more detail about the building, the, the preferred option, and what is the preferred option, we're going to study four of these, and by July, we are going to select one of them. And that one is going to fall into one of two categories, all new, and maybe one of two of these that are all new, in terms of how they might be arranged on the site, or it can be a renovation addition, and that also is going to be like how are they arranged on the site, 
So the, that's when you, when you get your preferred option, you really now start going into the schematic drawings and you, you really get into what the costs might be. When you say July, do we, do we have a particular date? July 11th. 11th, okay, thanks. So in this process, we're sort of halfway through the process on, July, on June 4th, there's going to be another forum. And th this is really, this forum is going to be a little different than the last three um, in that it's really an update on where we are in the process because we want people to sort of stay up and not <coughs> sort of, and it, we won't have necessarily the answer to every question, but I think we'll have a much better idea of what we can say about each one of these projects because right now this is, this is one of the first of the four. What can we say about this at this stage? Well, what this particular option um, allows is that we keep FUSCO and we keep the facade of column and the height of column because one of the things we've learned um, is that column actually has great height potential inside of it that you don't know because of the way um, the floors have been put in, but there is a lot of height. It also has the, the wings, the um, in back of the building going out toward the fields. And then in the middle of that, you also have, you, you have sort of a core area for your media center, uh, cafeteria, gymnasium, the, the um, area for, the area for the performing arts is more off on one of the back wings. So does, how well does this work in a lot of areas, like yeah, the phasing of it, um, the adjacencies of different things, um, traffic around it. So uh, the potential for modulars, where would you put the modulars? What it might be some issues around the site work? Because when you go behind the building, and, and for that matter, regardless of whether we build in front or whether we build in back, in this project, the very fact we're staying on this site means we have to deal with the chromium um, problem in the back. Here you're going to have to deal with it. There's going to have to be, you know, some fill. How much fill? What would that would take? So this, those issues will be addressed in the further study as well. In fact, there is a rubric that was developed um, and uh, which we will share with you and the public uh, um, that we have to look at lots of different factors that, that you can look at in a study and, you know, take a look at, well, does this one really address it well? That might get a plus one. It's sort of so-so might be a zero, and that doesn't address it, it'll all be a minus one. So you can start to get some relative comparisons of these. Sorry. Um, so I know that when we looked at the pure renovation, we felt it just did not meet our educational vision you know, right. needs. Um, do, is our sense now that all of these four options basically equally meet the educational needs, or are we, is that something we're going to discover in this process that maybe some meet them better than others? Great question, and the answer is yes. Okay. In fact, Which part? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that we're, we've gone through this whole thing of visioning, and we developed these guiding principles mm -hmm. about the educational plan. So in the month of May, we haven't set the dates yet, um, um, the principal, um, assistant principal, myself, and a couple other people are going to sit down and take the guiding principles, mm -hmm. and we're going to go through each one of the plans and <coughs> do that analysis to the extent that we can with what we know about the plan right now, and then report it back to the building committee. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't really, if one doesn't work as well for the educational plan. That seems pretty important. Right. And so. And you, you can still modify these plans if mm -hmm. that comes up. So for example, if these wings are too far apart, you could switch to the gym with one of the wings. Right. Yeah. right. Exactly. And in fact, that could happen. Let's say we picked, let's say, I'm not saying this will happen, but say this was the option we picked as the preferred option. It's a renovation addition. That's the big category. When we get into schematics, you're absolutely right. You could do a little bit of switching. You could make the wings actually be more perpendicular. Um, you might have to put maybe in some more connectivity between Fusco and the column house. There might be other things, but the massing will stay relatively the same. 
you're not going to switch in a renovation addition. Like we pick this and then we go back to MSBA later and we see one of the wings going forward. That probably won't happen. So it's, it's at that level. But the, the final design of the school within that broad massing concept will stay that way, but a lot of other changes. And the interior will change. You, we might we wanna, may want to just change some uh, ways that classrooms are oriented to each other. All right, so could you do the next one, Karen? Thanks. That, those are the possible floor plans. That's what we're going to be sitting down and looking at very, very carefully. Okay. So here was the second one. This one also is a renovation addition model. What is different in terms of the massing concept here is that the, the wings come onto the front lawn. And one of the things we did in the survey that went out that people responded to, there was an overwhelming percentage of people saying, yes, it was important to keep some of the green lawn. But there's other considerations we'll have to go through. That is only one factor. In fact, probably not as, probably in the scheme of things, maybe not the most important factor. So anyway, this is a renovation addition. But the thing that's interesting in this one, and this is one that could change, let's say we pick this one. If you notice, Fusco is there. On the left-hand side, do you see that white? That's Fusco. And so the wing in the front abuts Fusco, so you don't see the facade anymore of Fusco, but you have the building area itself. So this wall, well, huh? OK. So for the wall right behind us, this won't be here anymore in this design. Okay, we're going to push the Fusco. The white over on the left, on the left, right over there. That's, the, that's Fusco right now. And so you can see that the wing in front of it actually goes almost out to the sidewalk. Um, but when we actually get into the schematics, maybe it'll find that they start opening, you know, looking at this, this isn't going to work. And this might just have to be new. It's hard to say. But some of the middle part of column um, would be some of the old building. And what would the facade be like? Well, one thought was the, the columns would be interior. Well, maybe, maybe that won't happen. Maybe the columns would be exterior. Those are smaller things, but this is be the, the big concept. Um, OK, so onward to the third option. Uh, this one, oh, you've got it. That's right. Can you, does it? That's the only part about the click. Oh, you can do it. Yeah, the clicker doesn't work really well from here. I'm moving the. So this is the third option. This is an all new. And in this all new, again, what you see is a much more sprawling design of it with um, two areas in the front. Right? You've got that one. Yeah, those two that are on the front lawn. They're not as far into the front lawn as the last one. And your center core has all of your common areas of cafeteria, um, the learning commons. Um, performing arts is over on the right in the back lot, sort of where the preschool was, uh, is, I should say. And uh, so the performing arts goes to the back there. So this this is one of the new, the new concepts and um, of new. So we have two renovation additions, and we have two new. And so the, the fourth one, which is new, um, could you click to the next one? Karen. OK, this one is new, totally rectangular, covers the entire front lawn, and then some coming backwards. And so part of the study here, one of the reasons this is an option is that you know, of course, one of the concerns is, can you build the new high school and have everybody stay in the building while that's going on? And to save modulars and, you know, swing space costs and, edu and, you know, preserve things sort of normal during the construction. Well, one of the things they will be studying in this is whether that is really uh, something that could be delivered on in this model. It may not be possible to build 
the back of this building um, of this model before you tear down the front of this, these buildings. And so we've got to look at that. That's one of the things to look at. But, there, but all, of the, all of the things in the rubric that we um, will address will be, all, will be part of this. And it will, we've sent it to you once, but sometimes you can get lost in all of this. Um, we'll send you the rubric so you can see it too, and we'll certainly be posting it's online. Um, we may add to it as well as we go through this process, trying to really be um, as thoughtful as we can be. So th this is where we are in, a, in the process. The next three building meetings um, this month, the end of this month and next month, we'll, we'll have more design information about all of these as we go forward. And then when we get to June 4th, we'll be where we are at that point. And so we'll just share everything where we are so people can see. Um, we, it, it may be possible on that, uh, forum to sort of get a, you know, to get a, a test of where people think. In fact, when the high school is having a presentation about that this week, they're doing an interesting um, feedback loop where they have a cool and a warm response. So they get to do a cool and a warm, so you get a sense of where that is. And maybe that might be an, a, a way we might do it too, we'll see. But anyway, um, it's a very exciting time in, in where we're, we're moving with this, but we, the timeline for this is, some people feel it's fast. What, the feedback we get from our OPM is that it's, it's pretty normal uh, pace, but it, it goes from backwards design again. We, we knew where we want to be in terms of an override where we want to be in terms of beginning construction, and then you have to work your way backwards. Where do you have, what do you have to do in order for that to happen? What do you have to do for that to happen? So you're back to where we are now. And what we had to do is get this into MSBA yesterday, which we did. And then the next one is to get the preferred option and all the supporting documents into MSBA by July 11th. And then once they go to the board meeting, which is late August, they will, they will tell us if they agree with us, and our architect tells us that she has never had the experience of them overturning the, the town's preferred option. Then we will really delve into the next part of it, which is much more detail about it. There'll be more opportunities for the public to hear what's happening. This process will continue all through next year as we start developing a very detailed design that will get costed out because before you can even go to an override, you have to know how much it's going to cost and how much MSBA is going to support it. Uh, and, so, and so that you can understand the level of detail that has to go on in order to actually truly get a, uh, an accurate cost figure. So that's where we are. I don't yeah. know if there's anything you'd want yeah. to add to that. I was just going to add a few things. Um, first, for people here and people watching at home, the reason the numbers on the alternatives are kind of odd, you know, going from th two to six, five B and things, was that they're selected from an array of options that the building committee saw. And um, second, uh, this last one that's all rectangular, um, we originally, the MSB expects you to put in three proposals. The building committee felt very strongly that it was important to include this one. Many of the building committee were not sure they like this one as their favorite option. Um, but the reason it was important to include is it has the possibility of being a faster, cheaper, easier build. Uh, and because of that and because of the concerns to try and minimize the economic impact on the town, we felt it was important to evaluate. But because people felt like uh, ambivalent about the, uh, this idea, um, we ended up compromising and saying, okay, we're gonna put in four instead of three. Um, and so we have two all new construction. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is some of, one of the things that is going to be part of the study 
um, as we compare the alternatives is traffic studies. So we're going to be looking at traffic patterns and possible, like, what if we bring in a road from um, Grove Street and things like that, and what sorts, you know, do any of the alternatives work better in terms of traffic flow? I think they'll also be looked at for parking um, and the abil ability to have supply parking spaces for all of our staff. Um, and I can't. I can't remember anything else that's being studied. It, oh, and is bike path, connection yeah, to the well, bike path. all of them will have connection to the bike path. That that's not a question. You know, that's clearly going to happen. Um, but the traffic may make a difference in terms of how, you know if one's if they're two exactly the same and one has really good traffic and one has mediocre. Well, then we go. Mm -hmm. um, and underground parking, whether that's an option in these two. The, the underground parking was an option in everything. I don't know for sure if it's an option here, no. but in all of the other ones, it, it's not listed on all of them. It's shown on some of them just to give the idea that it's possible, but it can actually be added into any of them if we so choose. Um, there are people who point out that underground parking is expensive compared to flat um, street level parking, the thing is you have to have land to put the flat street level parking on, which we do not. So uh, it'll end up being weighed and balanced and we'll have to decide money versus space and such. Um, so I think those were my main thoughts about things. Um, do, do you want any questions now or does anyone have questions? Um, we've heard at town meeting this week a lot about the town yard project and they're like strangely like as soon as you said Grove Street I was like wait a second town yard um, which is obviously another major project that we're taking on which is great um, how like do has any like has, has there been any like interchange between like the town yard? I mean, I'm sure there has been, but like we're all talking to each other, right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. In fact, yes. we have a meeting yes. about it early next week. Um, yes, it's, um, of course, like anything, can, it's the same idea. Can you build the, the, the new building in another spot than the old building and then tear the old building down? So you create the, so, but the question is where does the new building go? The new building, meaning the town yard. If building, we did the or, town yard, so the, should it. they renovate the existing one or should they build a brand new one? And then where would the new one be built? So that's part of the, the discussion. And if, it, if a new building is built, how does that impact this project? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Hannon. Just to add, John Denazio, Adam Chapdelaine, and John Cole are on both committees. Mm -hmm. So there's cross pollination yeah. right there. Good. Okay. Right. Dr. Strack, too. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, so I, I think another criteria to look at is um, the ease of separating sections off for after school use yes. and community use and some, some of the projects may be easier to do that than others. That's one of the rubrics is the yeah. community use piece. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, important. Oh, oh yeah. So the rubric, that's the rubric that you're sending us. There's a rubric of all these different key things yeah. that newly developed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. John, did we, was there anything you'd want to add? No, I, I thought that the underground parking was only an option on um, the one that builds out front. Yeah, the, she the only top. put it back into, the, it turns out the four options that we picked, we didn't realize it. None of them had the underground, uh, underground in them. Oh, okay. So she put one so we could keep it alive for exactly okay. your point. Mm -hmm. Put it in one of the designs. Mm -hmm so that it remains an option to discuss as we go forward in a preferred option. Yeah. So you so have to have some feature in one of the options in order to keep it alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but it could be added into yes. some of the others. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. We hope. Right. We no, I know. Oh, it no. it yeah. depends on many yeah. things. Just. All right, the other ones won't be as long. Um, you, can flip, you can just flip that off. Thanks. Um, Gibbs, is, in terms of the building, um, everything is moving along 
as it should in terms of the design. There, I think the only thing that was a, a little bit of um, an issue with the building, it's, well, it's really not even the building, it's the outside of the, the area next to <clears throat> the cafeteria, which is where students would be out for recess. We are, you know, we're discussing a different proportion of how much will be sod versus something else, and whether that what that something else will be. Will it be asphalt? Will it be poured rubber? Which I might go on record as saying is my preferred because it does keep your, it it does um, keep uh, environmentally you, you 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 it's permeable. So the water can go through, it keeps our lead points up. But we need something that, you know, 450, 60, 80 kids out there every day for recess, sod's just not gonna last a week, no matter how long we let it grow in. So, but we should have some sod, it was part of the original um, um, specs. But I think uh, this, the whole team working on it, I think we're in a good spot. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but we're working on that. So that was the only little building glitch that we've had um, recently. Uh, I think the, the, the focus for us right now, us being the administration and teachers, is you know, continuing the work on the schedule, continuing the work on professional development, projects, um, the most, uh, the we have more meetings next week on the schedule. What, we, what went out this week was the first letter on transportation. Um, and so we'll find out how many people um, are, want to take advantage of the, the, the transportation and then we'll see how many seats we have available for people who would like to pay a fee, which would be the same as the, the fee for the Bishop bus. Just a uh, Mr. Cardin. Just, just a point on that transportation. The, the bus route map wasn't provided, so people are sort of blindly not, you know, when they're making the decision, if they're really far from one of the stops, they may want to choose to take the T bus instead. Mm -hmm. So that might be helpful to add to the, red, the, yeah, the site. Yeah, we had the map ready to go out, and then somebody, I'm, this is actually good to hear, because we, we thought, I didn't see that it was attached to it. I, we have a separate diagram. I can send it out that shows exactly what the route will be. Well, almost exactly. We had to change the. We haven't changed the map since we've changed how it's going to enter. Um, yeah, Gibbs, basically but, where the pickup but, spots are. But the, yeah. but you can see the pickup spots. But in a visualization of it, if you can picture a, a Pierce, Stratton, Bishop, what that's going to look like. Those are the pickup points. So if you're living closer to Mass Ave, you, know where it is. you might want to just go on MBTA. You have a lot more. Right, right. But yeah. that information wasn't given out. So no, it's on the it's on the letter. It tells you what the bus route stops are. It goes okay. yeah. it goes Pierce, Stratton, Bishop, and then it goes Dallin, um, Bracket, and then the third stop is going to be at Colonial and Lake. I right. think that's where we're that going to do it. That was the question. I think it was open. That was that was on. The, you can take the bus. bus? <laughs> I can get on the bus. I like I get it. Enough. Uh, I just, I, if I may, I have a question about Hardy. Is it okay to switch to Hardy? Yeah, I'm. Right. Hardy was going to be third on this list. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait for Hardy. Um, I think that it said on the bus application that the morning bus, that um, the 7 a.m. bus becomes oh yeah, yeah that makes sense the, the first bus out in the morning is the first bus that leaves in the afternoon mm -hmm. right okay good. it's the second bus in other words if you're on the early bus, bus in the morning you're on the you're on the 2 30 bus. bus good right yep. all right great so you 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 sort of one one group has to have the 30 minute wait now it is possible this is one of the, why we want to get this out early i don't know if this will be the case but we'll see um, we have after school care as part of our programming. And not only do we have a program there, but Park and Rex does as well. So that's more of K-5. But we may find that in the afternoon, given all the activities that are going on, that the number of kids that are going home may not be the same as the number of students coming in in the morning, in which case, Maybe all students will be able to leave on a bus at 2.30 that want to go home. 
We won't know that until we you know, go through this process. And for the, there are some of us, one of us who's sitting at this table who happens to have a child who literally, if I map it from my backyard to the Gibbs is 2.0 miles. And if I stand on my front porch and Google map it, it's 1.9 miles. Is there like, it's unbelievable. Like we're within feet, right? Um, of whether or not we're going to be in or not. Is there any way to find that out or, or Mr. Um, Angelo will inform people of their eligibility yes. status he will inform by me. June 1st. By or June 1st. Well, back in the fall, remember the survey we sent out? We, we put a locator on that. Um, it's by walking. It's not as the Google Maps isn't a walking, I think. it's a Isn't it an aerial? You can make it walking. But, can, but it, you make it walking? He, his, his data is a, a teeny bit different. Okay. That, that link to the survey is still available. Okay. So you can actually go back in and look on there. On okay. the locator. All right, I'll send that link back out so people can have it. But um, our GIS person, Adam Kurowski, created the locator. Um, we, use that, we use that for the, um, have been using it for the Audison bus too. Great. So yes, so if you're in doubt, just send an application in. You'll find out. Or um, <laughs> You can go to that link that you had in the fall. I'll send it in from locator. my backyard, though. I'll make sure I email it from there. <laughs> so it's not as the crow flies? I thought that Massachusetts law was as crow flies. Well, the law is. Okay, so no, we, that is just, yeah, we right. actually looked that up. We were very curious about that. And it is um, walking. Yeah. Okay. Which is actually to people's advantage yeah, because... Point. You know, if crows flies is a shorter distance. Right. No, that's that's. I'm not questioning. I think it's better for our families than it. We're yeah. doing walking, but I really I thought the law said crow flies. But okay. Whatever. Yeah. Mr. Hardy. 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 Right. Two questions. Number one, dry, When I saw the staging map originally, when I was the Permit Town Building Committee, where the fence was going to be, it didn't look like it was going to take all the space that it has now taken. I could not see, I'm not saying it isn't, but how do the students get to the, what's left of the playground without walking through or very close to the construction area? That's number one, which the other one is there's jackhammering going on. The people doing the jackhammering have ear protection. I know the kids don't, so I'm, I'm concerned about that aspect of uh, health and wellness of the, the students and stuff. I know the jackhammering is not going to be consistent throughout the construction and stuff, mm -hmm. but I know in part of the contracts and everything, they take an allowance for MCAS and noise and things of that nature. I'm not trying to hold the project up, but I am concerned about the safety of the children uh, with the, all that noise. I'm if sharing that with you. Yeah. I don't expect an answer on the jackhammering right now or the other aspect. Well, I can tell you to, on the issue of the pathway, there was actually quite a bit of uh, discussion about the pathway in terms of the width of it. If you can picture the back of the school in, that's adjacent to the residential areas, there is a pathway that can go out that back door of Hardy and around. Um, so there'll be walk, like a, a, a narrow one fence and then the green part of the fence that's blocked off to walk all the way around. Yes, you I can I assume come. they're gonna be supervised while they're doing that. Oh, sure. Definitely out of sight of everything. With that high fence. Do I think uh, actually that's more for s safety uh, rather than what that's what they probably use. So I, I can't say that for a fact. But they lost an awful lot more of the playground they, than it I did, thought they it were going to. It did appear to be losing more than we anticipated. Yes. The other part on the the jackhammering and the the noise aspect of it, I I don't know how. You, well, the, I, the people that are actually doing the jackhammering have safety. They have the the ear the to protect their own ears and stuff. They're not supposed to be jackhammering that kind of loud noise during the school day. Definitely not during MCAS, the whole MCAS well, schedule. I, I, I know that part's so, coming. I think it's supposed, supposed to be done be prior to and after the school day. That okay. was what the discussion was, because that was I, a concern. I guess I would ask you to just check with the principal to, to make sure that's being done. I know when issues similar to this happened at Thompson, they were taken care of right away contractor and everything dealt with it, but they had to bring it to their attention. So if it has, isn't happening and it's done during non-school time, great. If it is, 
I just ask you to. That, that, I, I got to tell you, that has come up so many times in conversation about this, and Kristen's been very clear about about that, as, as, a, as I have too. I, we don't. The windows are too close, and as we get into the warmer months, you don't want to close the windows either. But at the same time. I know. Well, the Thank fence you. is up. That we're going. We're moving forward. This is this is the good news. Um, we're also moving forward with uh, planning for the Lake Street Playground. Um, and also, we've talked about, well, maybe it'll take a little bit longer, but we're probably going to do more recess over at Thorndike Field. Just walk over there. It's a five-minute over, five minutes. So, it's a, so it may have a little bit more recess time. And the kids get to walk, too. Just be aware if there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of water on that field. <laughs> So many impediments. <laughs> yeah. It's a great field. It's a great field. Well, maybe we'll get to walk up and down the, the bike path. We'll yep. see. But th we, we do think that they have to get away from the school for a, a recess when they can. Um, but anyway, we're moving forward with that. And fortunately, we are going to have some summer months to have some of the, the, you know, the, some of the more major construction done. All right. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. McNeil <laughs> if he would give a little bit more of an update on a Colonial Day, the conversations that have happened since um, the last time we met. And cause he's had a number of conversations um, over the last couple weeks. And one of the things that I'll let him speak to, but I'll just say that there's been some perhaps lack of clarity as to exactly what the letter said. So I thought it could be a good time to, to clarify that and just talk about some of the comments that have happened in, over, the la over the last couple of weeks and some of the responses you've had. Yes. So um, I'll first start with clarifying, you know, the information that was in the letter. Um, I specifically addressed the, the costumes and the activity where students dressed in colonial um, attire for a colonial day. Um, and that was something that was very specific in my letter. And I don't, I think that, you know, just from people talking about the letter, from, you know, conversations out in the community, that, that somehow that morphed into people thinking that we were trying to abolish colonial day. And that might be associated with the language in the letter that, you know, third grade teachers are going to spend the time this summer of looking at the curriculum and looking how we can make the activities more inclusive. And part of that, you know, consideration might go back to looking at how we're naming Colonial Day. Um, so I think that I want to, I just want to be very clear that the, you know, the purpose of, for the letter was to address the students wearing Colonial attire during Colonial Day. That was the only thing that we, you know, address, and that was something that we were going to say that that's no longer going to happen for a colonial day. I want to say that most of the, I, I've received the vast majority of emails uh, in support of the decision since the letter has gone out to the community. Um, there have been people who have had some uh, pushback on the decision uh, for various reasons, and, you know, you know, since then I've had very actually very productive conversations with individuals who've also like asked about the process of us coming to this decision and part of that consideration was we went through um, the use of a representative model while I was trying to identify uh, individuals from school councils and PTO as I explained in the last and during our last school committee meeting that you know at the first date that I had scheduled to have this uh, discussion that you know, I had a representative from every school, uh, one or two parents from school council or uh, PTOs, and I'm not aware of how each individual school conducted that process. So I know that there's some people that wanted to be on the on the in part of that discussion, but weren't, um, you know, selected. But I will say that you know the decisions. It was not a discussion of like-minded people. That we had different people um, who walked out of that meeting saying that they, they wanted to have the dress still be part of 
the uh, process. And that meeting wasn't a decision-making meeting. It was just me listening to the various uh, perspectives. So since then, I've been able to d have you know, some conversations with individuals who still might disagree with our decision, but they understand that we're trying to be very inclusive and make sure that all students, um, you know, notwithstanding their cultural or background, they feel welcomed. And that all perspectives of different cultures that were around that time are represented and that we're not omitting any perspective. So that's our goal. Um, so, you know, I think that this has, you know, been in the discussions I've had and the letter to the community has also brought up discussions around race and culture, and I feel like that's, at least we have the community talking about it. And, you know, we're going to use this opportunity, and I've talked to Dr. Bodie, we've talked to, you know, Dr. Carlos Hoyt, and uh, we're, we, we're, you know, just, you know, looking at different ideas of how we can utilize this opportunity to, to move into more of a discussion with the community about race and culture and what does it mean to be culturally competent and then looking at that word being culturally competent and, and what does that mean because it means different things to different people. Some people th think that you know even the words culturally competent is not appropriate that we have to find a different phrase to um, exhibit our goal of being inclusive of, of everyone. So I want to use this as an opportunity, and I know that Dr. Bodie uh, does as well, and so we've had that discussion, like what does the next step look like, and, and what type of organizations we can partner with in the community in order to advance that conversation. And so we'll talk about that and how it's going to maybe look at some of the things that our, our policies, as, you know, as a school committee, as you're looking at policies along the lines of being inclusive. And so what, what, what does that mean as we look at curriculum and instruction and some of the traditions or as you, as you will as that's related to like colonial day as an example and how some of the changes will be made in order to, for us to reach that goal of being inclusive inclusive all right we've um begun to reach out to think about what kind of a community conversation could we have what would that look like mm -hmm. um that would be um very respectful because i think some of the stuff that's gone on in this discussion of it hasn't re hasn't been as respectful as it could be. Um, people have been labeled with different names, which is not right. I think when you, when you have something like this change, no matter um, how, um, you know, reasoned it is and thoughtfully thought about, there's still a loss. And I think when you have loss, there's, um, it's, you know, it's it's something that people sometimes go through a grieving process about too. So I, I don't. I think that it's been unfortunate that some of the responses that have gone on the social media. But so this is an opportunity for us to take a look at our, our you know, what we're doing as a community. And I've I've reached out to the Human Rights Commission, and we're going to be reaching out to Ideas, which is a group that we belong to as well, to see if there would be um, what that would look like. And so I, all I can say right now is we're thinking about it. We're trying to figure out what that might be. If you, and if you have any ideas, we're happy to hear that. Um, but maybe something late May, maybe early June, something that would work, uh, work well. Because it's, another, it's an opportunity. Um, and also, as we talk about it, that will influence the kind of work we're doing this summer with teachers about the third grade. It's like, how do we talk about the early days um, of our country in a more inclusive way. Maybe that we will keep some, a lot of the activities of a colonial day. First of all, they vary quite a bit from school to school anyway, but what will that look like? What other kinds of things might we want to do? And um, it's open question at the moment, not sure. But, and, and the other thing, I think that we will also, we've had a request um, to just sort of have, have a little bit more of a, a, su a written summary of all this, and we'll, we'll be working on that so you can all have that too. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss. So I um, talked to a lot of parents who are upset and parents who weren't upset. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, just a sort of a comment about process. I think some of the problems was that people weren't in the room together mm -hmm. necessarily hearing each other's concerns. And so while I do think sort of a representative model was absolutely the right model, it, it might have been nice to sort of publicize that people could come and listen to some of that discussion because you know, when you, when you get, I mean, I don't think that these kinds of decisions should be made um, by majority rule. Like, mm -hmm. when, if, if, if a group says, this it feels painful to me, this is, you know, 
feels disrespectful to me, that has to be very seriously considered. But it's also very easy for the Diamond Group not to really understand that. And if they're not in the room, mm -hmm. they're not hearing people's concerns, they just don't know it, and they just don't get it, right? I mean, I mean they, they just haven't heard it before, so it's just right. it's new to them, right? It's new. Not they don't, can't get it, but, but you know, if they're in the room, they hear it, they're like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, right? Mm -hmm. So I do feel like maybe that process could have improved, that we're just sort of um, made people aware of the various meetings that were happening so they can come and watch if they wanted to, even if they weren't, you know, in a forum making the public thing. They could just, you know, sort of be sitting that, so. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I've learned a lot from this process. Um, <laughs> as you know just being new to the position but also when you look at you know different issues or topics that are emotional and and how can we I think you know that's something I'm going to continue to always consider is like how do we can how can we best have a respectful conversation and even having you know some discussions with individuals <coughs> who were privy to those different comments going back and forth on the social media sites they understood they were like oh I understand you know, about not having a larger discussion because that's not what we wanted to do because of the type of, you know, emotionally charged comments that were going back and forth. So we're trying to have a respectful, where every, a respectful conversation where we're listening to each other, even if we have opposing viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that, you know, will continue to be a complex, you know, um, uh, you know looking at it as a, as a complex issue when you have different topics that, that garner this type of emotion. So I definitely learned from this process, and I, and I want everybody in the community to know that I learned from the process. <laughs> and that, but I do, I do wanna say that it wasn't, it wasn't an effort to, to exclude any voices. And, I, and that's the one thing that I, I don't want to be out in the community, that we did this in order to you know, muffle or mute and we already had a decision in mind and we wanted to mute the opposing viewpoint and not listen to it because that viewpoint was represented at the discussion that we did have. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Shortman. Yeah, I can see how this would be a very emotional topic for some folks. Uh, if, if, if this is something that uh, hurts in some way, um, to voice that concern in a more public forum would be much more difficult. And um, I, I think the way we, we did it in soliciting folks in a more comfortable environment is appropriate. Uh, so that, that leaves us with, with the issue that uh, how do people come to learn that we're doing this and we're planning to go in this direction? Um, there, there's no perfect thing, and, and any time you announce a decision like that, you're going to have a community reaction. I'm very proud of the people I've talked to on both sides of this issue since the announcement came out. So I've heard from a lot of folks and people who took a, how can you take away this fun thing attitude toward in the beginning, thought about it a little, took a look at the diversity of the district and the children we're educating in our classrooms and said, you know, this does make sense. And a couple of people still said, well, yeah, I, I hear the concerns, but I don't like it. it would. So we're never going to get un unanimity, but I think that uh, when you come up with a well-reasoned and thoughtful decision, uh, the community will come to accept it. And I'm sure that uh, the, the teachers in this district who are wonderful will come up with a way to make something that's really mm -hmm. fun and really dynamic mm -hmm. and and incorporates all the best parts of the, uh, the study we've been doing without the stuff that's emotionally charged. So I'm very appreciative of your efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I was going to say a lot of what uh, Jen Jen Jennifer said. Um, so I, I mean, I do, I do think that the rollout, you know, was a, a little bit flawed. Um, people felt that their voice had not been heard because they didn't know um, that they had representatives within that meeting um, and and I mean that you didn't name them so um, and then you had the announcement from one of the principals about changing it from one day to a four-day Puritan thing so that seemed like he was responding to your effort even though apparently it was an independent effort he also didn't have much outreach to his own community so I, I do think that um, in the, this historically has been a parent run activity and I think it's certainly fine for the administration to step in and say, 
this is not something we want as a district because it's during school hours. Um, but because it was a parent run activity and parent designed in some cases activity, um, there could have been a little bit more sensitivity to those parents who had spent so much effort in years past on the on, on the on developing it um, to let them hear the concerns, which are legitimate and, and needed to be responded to um, it, before rolling out the policy. So I think you've learned your lesson, and, and, and uh, I appreciate all the efforts um, that you have with meeting all the meeting with all the parents and talking to people. Um, but I do want to pass on some of those concerns that I've heard. Thank you. Well, I do, I want to emphasize that I reached out to the principals just to figure out, because I think there was a question like, what is Colonial Day going to look like this year? And so, you know, one of the concerns at one of the schools that you're talking about, that many of the schools are doing the same things that they did last year. Mm -hmm. and, and parent participation is part of it. Mm -hmm. And I understand, like, what are the four components that were basically presented to me as I listened to the opposition. They wanted something fun. They want something immersive. They want something where parents can be involved. And they want something memorable. And those things, as I read for what the principals are planning for this year, there's not a lot of difference from what they did last year. And that parents are going to be involved. So I, I, employ, I implore all parents, if they have a question about it, to reach out to their building principal in order to get the facts. And that's, that's one thing I want to make sure that we're doing. We're getting the facts and not myth or rumors. We're not trying to not teach that, peri that period of time in history. We understand that it's very important to our American history. We want kids to learn about it, but we want to learn about it in an inclusive manner. And that, again, I go back to my letter only addressed mm -hmm. dressing up. It, didn't, it did not ask any, we didn't ask any principals or anyone to say no longer include parents. So that is something that I want to stress that I think that after looking at what the principals are planning for this year, a lot of it is still has lots of parent participation, lots of the same activities that they did last year. They're just not dressing up. Um, I think I appreciate what you've done. Um, I'm a little concerned that you've had to take on all the conversations because to me, this was an administrative decision. You were the, you and Mr. Coughlin were charged with working on it, but it's not your decision, it's the administrative well, it's decision. Involved. And so it, it's, I feel like it's, it's not you to answer it. it it's, you know, it, it, it should be coming to the administration and then, going out, but. Well, I say no, I did volunteer. I actually enjoyed having these type of conversations. Number one, I'm new to the community and I wanted people to get to know me. And so I think that through my conversations, they understand that, you know, what, what, what I am like as a person, my thought, my, um, my administrative style, and that I'm open to listening. And I think that's what, that, that being in this type of situation was perfect for me to get to know individuals from the community, especially in a situation that was kind of tense and contentious. But we came out of it with a, you know, I think we came out of it like saying, oh, this, this person can actually do what he's going to say that he's going to do. And so I think that I volunteer, you know, I came to Dr. Bodie and said, this is what I can do in order to help with this. And it is part of curriculum and instruction. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make, I want to put that out there again that this is something that I took up on myself with the help of Dr. Bodie and Denny, and we all worked together with this, but in dealing with, I was getting the emails because it was my le the, the letter that I signed, but it wasn't necessarily my unilateral decision. Mm -hmm. But I just wanna say that I enjoyed this process. I think it was very helpful for me to get to know members of the community, and it was also helpful for me to listen to other people about the opposing viewpoint. So I just want to stress that, that okay. you know, that, yeah. this is something that was very thoughtful and I came to Dr. Bodie and I, and, and I shared, well, this is what I can do and I shared my ideas and she said, okay, you know. Let me, yeah, let me just, I wasn't quite done with, um, anyway, I just wanted to say that I'm glad that some sort of event or for whatever is being thought about that I think, to me, I don't think it would work as well to have people in the same room just watching. I think that would impede conversation mm -hmm. in the smaller group. But I think that you can report out the thoughts and mm -hmm. conversation threads that came up and quotes. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's, 
that does a long way of explaining yeah. what was going on. So I'm hoping that we'll have some of that some of the come up. We can, we can put some quotes in there. And we're still too. teaching the unit. I just want to be clear because some right. people were saying, oh, they, they took that decision to mean that we're trying to abolish right. Colonial Day, and that's not true. Right. So I just want to continue yeah. to emphasize mm -hmm. that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Just a few more things. Um, after school programs, I just wanted to give you a little update. We're doing more, have more conversations with people about increasing number of um, uh, possible openings for students. Um, I probably in another couple of weeks can give you something more definite, but for example, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to do 10 more in our immersion program at Brackett. Um, and we're looking at our other schools, and I know that um, conversations are going on at all the schools about how we can do this. Do I think it will get to all of the people on the wait list? Probably not, but I can tell you with our own programs, we have a, a, a multi-year look at this. It's hard, to, it's hard to have a huge jump because it's, it's more complicated than it might seem. And so, um, but we are moving in that direction. Then just some other just quick things. <clears throat> One fun thing is I'm, I'm sure people know, invite people to the Bye Bye Birdie mm -hmm. at, the, at the middle school this coming um, weekend. It's Friday, Saturday night at 7 o'clock. There's a lot of music things going on over the next week. <laughs> One of which is um, a jazz uh, a musical that's Sunday night at Town Hall at 7 o'clock in our Arlington High School Jazz Band has been invited to perform in it. So they will be there. And then the following weekend is the Pops concert. Now, if you haven't gotten your ticket, you need to hurry because of that those historically sell out. But the good news this year is that they're putting an extra performance on Friday night at 6 o'clock. Um, so this might be a good night, actually, if you had children that would like to come. It's a little bit earlier in the evening. So uh, those are great things looking ahead and um, I think that really covers it. Okay, great. So, moving on, consent agenda. Really, sorry. Really quick, just yes, the last please. one. Um, do we have a, no, a new kindergarten number? Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> 517. <laughs> yes. And how's our uh, how's our distribution going? Okay. Well, the distribution was it was all it was over the whole district. So I think what's happening is that if we go to five thirty, five forty, the question is where is the other room, classroom? And I can't answer that right now, but we're there's not a lot more room in any of our kindergartens right now, and we and I, I think there's sorry, go ahead. Well, one of the things, I, I, we've had at least, I don't know, 10, 15 families call. One of my goals when I do the, the buffer zones with my, my team is that, I have to, as I said to the principals, um, you know, balancing the class sizes is clearly one of the goals of the whole policy. But my third goal is to have as many parents happy as possible. And this year that did not work out so well because in pinwheeling to try to get um, many more students into um, the classroom we had to set up, that wasn't possible. But if, if down the road we have to set up yet another one, then people who are on the wait list, we can go back to them and say, you know, do you want to shift? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, we're going to be going through the parent orientations, which this year are going to be at different times in different schools. And then we're going to have the kindergarten um, on sites, but those aren't happening until June, so we still have some time before that happens. But the thing the parents should know is that the information in the parent orientations is the same district wide. The screenings that we do at each school are the same district wide, and if they do screenings in one school and they eventually go to another school, it all just goes over. So there's no problem with having screenings done in a particular elementary school if for some reason it shifts again in the summer. Good. Mr. Just Curtin? a comment. I mean, 
everything that I've seen from the numbers is that we are going to get to 530 or 540. So I, I hope that there is somebody doing that planning to see who can yes. shift and, and, you know, where you put the music room at Dallin or wherever, wherever it ends up going. Because, yes. Um, I think it's a, a very strong possibility. I put out to people saying, I, I need you to think about this plan. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Seuss? Can I have a, a related question? Um, what's happening with the playground at Pierce? Because I know Pierce will once again have a, a third kindergarten. And I know that the kindergarten playground has been an area of concern and, and there was money from the capital planning. Do we know the timing of that? I don't, I don't, I can't answer that tonight, but I don't know if John, you can. So this, Go ahead. <coughs> sorry, this is $20,000 in the capital plan to design for the next uh, playground build, which would probably be Pierce because mm -hmm. Uh, what we had in the capital plan was uh, 20000 design, 300000 build out, $20,000 design, $300,000 build out. Okay, and so that last year was taken out of our request and put into the rec department's request because that would be Bishop and that's technically not. Oh, your uh, microphone. Sorry. That's technically uh, rec department land. So right, they right, just right, put right. it in the proper. Okay, so, so, so next year there's a, a design for it and the year afterwards... There's money so in there. Nothing's happening this summer for building, but just designing. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kirk? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the uh, kindergarten enrollment and the uh, buffer zones were p uh, pinwheeling toward Pierce. Yes. And that if we have to go add another classroom someplace, it would probably be at. <laughs> you don't know. I don't want to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not tonight. Anyway. Okay. Now we're set. Okay. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant dated 4-12-18, warrant 1-8-2-0-8 in the amount of 637 thousand one hundred eighty seven and sixty cents approval of minutes school committee regular and organizational minutes april 12 2018 approval of no trips um, approval of meeting <coughs> public hearing on school choice thursday may 10th 2018 at 6 30 p.m do i have a motion so move second second okay all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstentions okay that passes unanimously and now we move on to subcommittee and liaison reports. Um, maybe we'll go through the committees first and then discuss BDAE. Could, so, yeah, budget? Sure. I'm sorry. Could I just move to defer that uh, discussion to the next meeting because of time? Um, I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect. Somebody will second it. It won't be a long discussion. Fine. Okay. Budget? Uh, nothing to report. We'll set up a meeting soon to um, handle budget stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, community relations. Uh, we had a meeting last night where we touched on a bunch of things very quickly. Um, we had representatives from the Arlington Human Rights Committee come to us with two documents that are still in draft form. One is um, sort of a, a town-wide document about the uh, response to hate incidents in schools and public places, you know, everywhere, right? It's just, it's not a school specific thing. Um, and the other one, which still needs a lot more discussion, we didn't get very far on it, is um, the idea of having uh, liaison relationships between Arlington Human Rights and schools. And, and, and just, that's been in existence for about seven years, but it hasn't, that relationship hasn't really been codified, so they're creating a document to codify that relationship. That was one thing. Then we um, talked very briefly about what we wanted to do um, about the after school problem and um, decided at this point we don't need to form a new subcommittee, that we could handle it in community relations, um, and that we, um, we're still sort of doing fact finding. You know, we have a lot of information, but we want to sort of talk to um, the various vendors at our schools and find out from, and, and have parents express their frustration to them and find out from them issues and problems that we may, may not know about. And so our next meeting, and we know they won't all be able to come, you know, getting everybody in a room together at once might be hard, but our next meeting, we'd like to invite them to send a representative, ideally, um, to hear from their concerns. And then, we did a lot of quickly, um, 
we talked about um, about uh, the office, you know, that the office hours, and decided to continue it. Maybe to cut out a couple so people don't have to triple, so that everyone could just do two rather than three, um, and to. Um, Keep it at uh, Cafe Nero seems to be the more popular place for the community. We get more people showing up, and so, um, and they've been very accommodating to us. And so, to keep it, go there, and I'll, I'll, I can talk to them about it. Just clarify. Yeah. So, on the fifth of May, we're going to do it at Cafe Nero. Uh, oh, so the, our next, next one. Next no, no, one. for next year. Yeah, so next year. No, for this year, we're going to keep to our published. Okay. And so I'll have to come up with a new published schedule so for the, next year. So the next one is at Whole Foods on the The next 5th. one on May 5th, um, if anyone's interested, is at Whole Foods at 11 o'clock, 11 to 12. Great. Okay. Um, curriculum, Mr. Thelman's not here. I'm assuming you, it hasn't met. We have not met. Okay. Uh, facilities? Uh, nothing at this time. I'm looking to find out what the la last group did and uh, hopefully set up a meeting. Okay. Policy? Uh, we will send out a doodle once we get a sense of Mr. Gilbert's schedule. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to remove the school enrollment task force from so our moved. list? So moved. Second. Mr. Hainer seconded. Um, any discussion? Um, all in favor? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could be removed from the list, but uh, I don't think we should talk to the town about disbanding it. It's not meeting it, now, so. It's, it might in the future, I guess. Right, I but we can that. appoint somebody Else. at that point, yes. Yes. at that okay. time, right? I just want to make sure you weren't going to talk to the town and say, let's disband it, okay. No, I'm just saying we take it off our to-do list because there's nothing to do. And if it goes back on, then we put it on. Okay, so um, we had a motion. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that passed unanimously. Legal services? Not ready to report tonight. Okay. Um, school committee, I mean, sorry, high school building committee you've heard from, uh, Gibbs committee, okay. and liaison reports. Um, can, so um, the other thing that we talked about last meeting was to appoint someone to the Human Rights Commission. I asked for names. Uh, Dr. Seuss was the only person who submitted as of interest, so um, could um, someone make a motion to appoint her as our school committee liaison to the Human Rights Commission? So moved. Okay. Any a second? Dr. Morgan, or, sorry. Um, second, uh, any discussion? Oh, Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, uh, on, on the discussion, um, we appoint five members to the Human Rights Commission. Um, they are our members, and in theory, they're supposed to be coming to us, uh, which is sort of leaving me. I, I'll, I'll vote for the motion. I mean, if, if somebody wants to go and be a liaison to anything, I, I, I'd vote for it. But uh, I'm, I'm worried a little about the precedent of us appointing members to serve on a board as being our members, and then us making the liaison rather than them coming to us. Um. We had the discussion at our last meeting whether we wanted to appoint a liaison to the Human Rights Commission. At that point, we chose to have someone. Um, so I think... Well, that, that's why I'm, that's, said I'm going to vote for it, but oh, I just wanted to... Yeah, oh, we didn't have... I did not express an opinion at that point, and I just wanted to put that on the record. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other discussion about this? Okay, all in favor of um, Dr. Seuss becoming our school committee liaison to the Human Rights Commission? So moved. Yes. Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. Um, and any other liaison reports or announcements? I Announcements? Mr. Hainer. I have a couple. Uh, Mr. F I'd like to share with the committee, Mr. Frederick Buckley, class of 1957, was an active in formation of the Arlington High School Alumni Association in 1991. At the first awards dinner, the class of 1947 made a donation to the Alumni Association in the form of a Fidelity Mutual Fund. Mr. Buckley became inactive in the group, but was identified by Fidelity just last year as the signer on the fund and was told that the money would be turned over to the state as an unclaimed fund. He did the necessary work to prevent this. Mr. Buckley has presented the Arlington School System a check for $8,963.19 to be used as scholarships in, in annual $500 increments in memory of the class of 1947. 
Thank you, Mr. Buckley, for your due diligence. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Okay. Mr. Schlickman. I think we need a, a motion to accept the gift. Uh, well, would you like to make that motion? Uh, I, I would like Mr. Hainer to make the motion. So moved. So I'll mm -hmm. second it. Okay. Any I'm further we did discussion? That since I think the check's already been cashed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? I have a, oh, I'm sorry. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes. Um, uh, team Deadweight, who are town officials, uh, uh, will be involved in raising money to fight to end cancer. Our team will compete with other teams pulling a fire truck at St. Camilla's Church this Saturday at 10 a.m. Please come, <laughs> watch us all strain, and cheer us on. <laughs> and my last announcement is EDCO School Committee Roundtable will be meeting next Wednesday at EDCO uh, on May 2nd. Uh, I will be happy to drive anyone that would like to go. It starts at 9.30, it runs from 9.30 to 11.30. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now going back to um, BDAE. So I falsely advertise this. It is not going to be a discussion. I'm going to explain things and we can have a discussion at our next meeting. Hopefully we will be in better time shape. So there was concern because of, okay. So Colonial Day, the announcement went out, then there was uh, concerns from parents that kind of escalated because of publication to, to social media. Um, a news channel picked it up um, and they called and caught me right as I was leaving my home for the rest of the day. And I couldn't talk to them then. So apparently they called around and later there was uh, Mr. Schlickman was able to speak with them. Um, there was later concern expressed that a member felt that no one should speak to them because of BD, BDAE. Um, and I just wanted to clarify to people in terms of speaking to the press first that people are not forbidden from speaking to the press. Um, we all have the right and the ability uh, what we <coughs> what members cannot do is say that they are representing the view of the committee unless they have been so tasked or unless they are the chair because under bdb the chair duties include be the public spokesperson for the committee at all times except as this responsibility is specifically delegated to others so in this case it was kind of my failure for not doing it and for not delegating it. However, I did not anticipate this news cycle, this becoming an urgent news cycle item that was happening and you know these things are gonna happen. Um, so BDAE, we all read it and signed it last time. Uh, it doesn't say anything that we can't speak to the press, um, but what I think where it got a little tricky was that in the article and in the voiceover in the interview, they used the phrase as a, they framed it, framed um, Mr. Schlickman's comments with as a member of the Arlington School Committee. This was the reporter talking to me, not being in English, I, I, did, I majored in science, but to me that kind of suggests the speaking on behalf mm -hmm. of the committee. This is me, all the English people can disagree. And I don't think that Mr. Schlickman meant to, meant, I think that was the reporter's take on things. I know Mr. Schlickman, I know he understands the limits and boundaries and, and everything of what we can and can't do. I think that it was lost in the reporter's translation of what he said um, and I just, I'm bringing this up because we have a new member and I wanted to be sure and my request is just that as people speak to the press that they make it clear that they are only speaking, that is only the view of one member unless they have been right. authorized to speak. And I did contact Glenn Kucher um, to ask him if there's specific language that should be used. Uh, he's, I couldn't talk to him but he sent an email back to me. Um, he said that's an interesting questions. He explains, he says they always explain to members that they are always free to speak for themselves and to only speak for the board when authorized. Thus we advise people to avoid language like speaking for all my colleagues, I can say that 
we all agree that I can assure you that the school committee feels about this as, as I do about, and, and clearly none of that was said. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, yes, you can talk to the press if you so choose or not, um, but it's important that we just clarify that you're only speaking on behalf of yourself. Yeah. And so that's, I'd like to leave it there unless Mr. Schlickman feels strongly. Okay, Mr. Schlickman. Mr. Schlickman feels strongly. <laughs> As a past president of MASC, I've dealt with this issue many times in many other districts. Uh, the first line in the uh, article was, as a member of the school committee, Paul Schlickman said he supports Arlington School District's decision to eliminate a traditional history lesson in classroom. So they are identifying me as a school committee member and saying that I, as an individual, yeah. support the policy. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. I think that as a member, I said what I believed uh, and was identified as a member of the governing body and in no way was representing anybody else than myself. Okay. Uh, I'm very, very careful in terms of dealing with the press, in terms of speaking only for myself. That is an excellent policy to do. I tend to use pronouns of I and put it into a personal frame when I'm talking, not on behalf of the committee or committee decision, and that's the way I approached it. Okay. I think that one of the things that we need to do as a committee is to engage positively with the media. I've gotten a lot of comments that it was a, a well-reasoned and positive uh, discussion, uh, well-received by folks in the community, uh, and that for us to present a positive image in a historical setting that we support uh, was, uh, was definitely supporting our administration, and I think that we were a benefit to that. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, okay, so. I'm not going to, we're not going to keep discussing that. If people feel strongly, please contact me later and I can put it back on the agenda and we can continue. So at this point, we go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which, if held in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect, collective bargaining may also be conducted. And are we going to exit only for adjournment? Yes, okay, so we will not be coming back after break. Um, so do I have a motion? So move. Um, do I have a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss seconds. Um, okay. Aye. Paul. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're now in executive session and we will exit. <laughs>